Hey, how hey, are you, hey. Bitella? Hey, well, and you, buddy. <laughs> Good to see you. Good stuff, man. So, for someone that doesn't often get on Skype, you did, you got it all sorted out. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm <laughs> fantastic at that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, how, how was you, the surf yesterday, bud? Was it good? Yeah, it was out of control. It, really? was, it was really, yeah, yep. Yeah. Like I said, it's just a crazy uh, direction of swell. So, it it normally comes from the southwest, um, the swell generated, whereas this was opposite. It was coming from the northwest. So, what you normally don't see break was breaking. So it wow. wasn't necessarily massive, but it was just crazy. Yeah, crazy to see the different different things. That Were you across. just at your usual like surf spot or did you go somewhere else to catch some of the No, we went swell? somewhere else. There was one oh, spot yeah. in particular. It broke on Cyclone Bianca back in 2011, I think it was. And we haven't had a swell event like that since then. So it's wow. been like seven years or wow. eight years or something, wow. something crazy. So. Yeah, so we went back to that spot anyway, which was pretty good. It must you be exciting, some sick waves. Eh? Yeah, it's crazy. Just the chase too, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. So, it's, yeah, it's always pretty exciting. Yes, it's cool, eh? I'm not out. one of those kind of Aussies anyway, Gareth. <laughs> 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 I'd beat you for South Australia and Square, eh? Hey? <laughs> oh, I just saw one at the bottom which says it's zero. Four seconds, thing. nah. So that's the first one, I think. Okay, oh, cool. Yeah, okay. We're good. It gave me a heart attack. You bastard. Better in the water, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, mate. Tech, tech was definitely not my thing. Great stuff, No. Buddy. Good. Cool, Thank, you Thank you very you much, so much, guys. Thank you so much, Thanks for that, man. Let's get it out there too, hey? That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I think it's an awesome yeah. thing yeah, to do, man. It. So thank you so much. Good. Yeah. Awesome, good, good. Have a good evening and we'll catch right. up with you soon. You might take care, my man. See you later. Eh? Yeah. Man. Yeah. See you later. Eh? Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. What's up, Gareth? Great, you guys. How are you doing, my man? How's it going? <laughs> yes. You're awesome, man. How about you? Yeah, very good. Thanks, bud. Uh, just finished a nice. <laughs> Long Easter weekend, lots of Easter eggs, overindulgence. <laughs> How about you? How was yours? <laughs> Likewise, I had a good one. Uh, it was pretty good uh, on the Easter egg front, pretty uh, restrained, and uh, uh, ended up having a good run on Sunday, which was great because I've been quite lazy. So I got down to the beach, which was awesome, man. Ah, that's awesome, bud. And, uh, so besides uh, runs, when was uh, when was the last time you ever got into a Barney, my man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Barney, Jeez, it's uh, been a little while, I uh, must say. I'm quite <laughs> grateful for that. <laughs> and uh, the last time was uh, really interesting, and as they all are, I think. And But I, I do, whenever you say Barney, I always just think of this little institution down where I grew up right on the beach uh, it's like this um, beach bar kind of a place where drinks are really really cheap brandy and coke was really cheap <laughs> and people would it's, it was called barney's and people would barney there all the time but it overlooked a, a surf spot um, back back home and one thing that would regularly happen would would be is people would get into a, a barney over the waves like if you dropped in on someone or you know, uh, got in their way when you're surfing or you you weren't local, people get a little bit, you know, a yeah. little bit weird with you. And uh, I think that's, you know, something that can sort of happen in uh, in the in the surfing world and uh, especially when it comes to like when the waves are really good, eh? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's funny that we, we're using the word Barney and it's because of our, our guest this week and he, he actually said it in the chat and it just reminded us about all the cool slang words that we kind of used to use when we were youngsters when we were kind of surfer wannabes and that sort of thing you know <laughs> like gnarly and slotted and frothing and these sort of words <laughs> but uh, what uh, what was really awesome about uh, the chat this week was um shannon warrell he's a big wave surfer and wow i mean you know you you watch these videos on youtube or facebook whatever these guys surfing these crazy waves and they're just massive you know and 
we actually got to speak to a guy who does that, you know, and he won an award of it too, you know, like the, the best tube of the war, the year award in 2017. And I don't actually think people, well, I mean, who knows, people probably do, but like, you know, when you've been on a big wave and like, you know, big for us is like six foot, eight foot, you know, <laughs> when you're at the top of it, it is super scary, you know, it's like you on the top of a diving board platform or on the top of a roof and you kind of look over and you're like, what, I've got to jump onto the floor into the water here and it's super, super scary. Uh, and, you know, these guys are doing it from tremendous heights. It's quite, quite phenomenal, actually. And it definitely takes a certain amount of courage to do that, take hey, Craig? <laughs> yeah it's like it just makes me laugh just thinking about it because it's it's on another level i mean it's not only just jumping off the diving board it's with a massive freight train uh behind you at the same time <laughs> and the like the courage is insane like you say but it you know where does courage come from and there's a lot of training that goes into these um, these guys and girls that are on the big waves and are in water, in the water all the time. And it, it takes a real special person and to get their mindset correct to be able to do this kind of stuff. And, and Shannon's no, no different. He's, you know, taking the time to train his mind to become a master of his, of his own thoughts and of himself. And in a sort of a strange waterman mindfulness sense, he's, taught himself to focus on positive anchors when he's on these big waves, if he's getting dumped or he's gone deep, as he calls it, in the underwater waterfall. And he goes into this place where he can become calm and get through it. And actually, the root of all of that is safety, you know, how to come out of that and make it out okay. And the cool thing is that he's now, you know, He's learned how to do it himself and he's actually helping others now too, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He, you know, he's using all the experience that he's sort of garnered over time from growing up in the sea and on the sea. And he's now using that to teach kids, you know, and the youngsters that are sort of coming onto the scene of uh, surfing or free diving or even just normal kids at school, you know, like how to deal with sort of day-to-day -day stresses. And it's, you can see kind of his light face, uh, his face lights up when he, when he talks about the, the teaching. It's something that yeah. sort of is really part of him now and he wants to do more of. And it's just something that's like comes so authentically to him, you know. And another thing which sort of transpires from that and has transpired from that is his wanting to make the world a better place and a safer place especially when it comes to surfing he experienced something really really harrowing uh, one day while he was um, fishing with his friends uh, for abalone and his his good friend greg was attacked by a great white shark and for a lot of that time when they were trying to save him, they never knew if he was going to live or not. And it was a really scary moment for him and the other guys that were with him. And off the back of that, he's created this company called Shark Eyes. And Shark Eyes is such a incredibly simple idea, but such an amazing concept. Uh, what do you think of it, Craig? Yeah, that's the beauty of it. Sometimes, um, you know, when something, you just know something works through a lot of anecdotal evidence and looking at nature, we've often discussed this, when you look back at um, situations in nature that um, you can actually learn something from. And, you know, it's a kind of a situation of, have you, have you ever felt like someone's watching you, you know, when suddenly your behavior changes when you're in that kind of scenario? And the the basis of shark eyes or the science behind it has to do with mimicry. And obviously we get into that in the chat. And it's quite fascinating how um, uh, how animals, big and small, all respond to certain primal sort of stimuli. 
and uh, and that's how shark eyes really work. So I think this is a good time to hear how Shannon Worrell ended up at the place of developing this cool technology and hear what makes him ridiculously human. All right. We have Shannon Worrell here with us today, and we're uh, super excited to have a chat with you. Uh, this gentleman is a big wave surfer, a father, a diver, an entrepreneur, and founder of Shark Eyes. And uh, how's your day been so far, Shannon? Yeah, it's been good. It's been a pretty relaxed one, actually. I was, uh, yesterday, there was a bit of a swell event over in West Oz, um, where a heap of waves were hitting really close on the beach uh, due to the swell direction. So I'm kind of a little bit bashed and bruised, actually. I've been <laughs> taking taking sand out of every orifice for the whole day, pretty much. So no, but good. So a bit of a lay day for me. So it's nice to be able to wind it down with you guys for sure. Yeah, so <laughs> nice. Did you take a few tumbles yesterday, or what was it like? I I did more tumbles than I made, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> it was it was really good. It was a crazy day. Um, just the really random swell direction. Normally in West Australia, the swell direction comes from the southwest, whereas it was coming from the northwest. So you know, it was just different waves were breaking that just don't normally break so yeah it was good exciting like so, once in a seven year eight a year kind of event you know? wow, wow. so exciting so, that so what does that mean like does the do the waves go a different direction or what is it what's the difference yeah well generally you know um because we're say you've got australia here our weather systems come you know around antarctica so the swell generated is normally generated off low pressure coming from the south of us yeah. whereas a cyclone formed up the top here and then the wind, you know, and then the swell gets generated off the wind speeds and the rest of it. So it actually gets thrown down the coast instead of coming directly up it. Oh, I don't cool. know if that made sense yeah, at yeah, all. No, no, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, mm. uh, so and, just totally really rare event. And the only reason the cyclone can actually move that far down the coast is because the water currents are really running strong at the moment. Um, so it needs, I think it's 26 and a half degrees, I think, is it? Or something yeah. crazy for a cyclone to keep on generating over water. And we don't even normally have that water temperature down this far. So it's just a lot of combinations ended up in this wow. perfect environment for, for crazy days. Yeah. So and it was good. Last did it you, was good. When last Sorry. did you have some big, uh, big swell like that in that sort of direction with those sort of breaks oh, breaking? It was probably seven or eight years ago. It was Cyclone Bianca, um, 2011. And I think it was 2011 anyway, yeah. So it's like a, it's a phenomenon. And before that, I don't even know if there's been one on record because I, I don't know if the water's been getting warm enough to get down that far. <laughs> so I'm like, that. so warming eight years life. older now, eight years older, how did you... How did you handle the, the the big swell? Yeah, I'm getting a bit more frail in my old age, to be honest. Like, I probably would have bounced back and surfed today again, maybe eight years ago. So, yeah, a little bit slower on the uptake for sure, but a bit wiser. Made a, made a few bit better choices. Uh, didn't didn't go so every month, so that was good. So, so what is it yeah. like? Do you have like this sort of group chats or whatever, or is everyone following the same sort of weather? Uh, I don't know people or stations or whatever yeah, and then no. everyone kind of just rocks up there like is there a big bunch of you guys that do it yeah it's kind of it's good and it's bad like um, you know with the internet nowadays and weather forecasting you can see a swell event or you know you can predict a swell event maybe a week out so then if it is going to be something crazy the phone starts ringing and people are you know, trying to hook each other up with who, who they're going to tow with and organise their partners and then figure out where, you know, where you're going to chase the swell to, up and down the coast or across the country or across the world, you know. Oh. So it's, it, it's planned from like, you know, a week out you start getting phone calls from everyone and everyone starts getting excited. Yeah. And then Mother Nature's so... <laughs> what's the word, unpredictable, that really you can get a good picture maybe two or three days out yeah. and then uh, then you make the calls to go for it. Wow. So it was like yesterday one of those uh, scenarios where you got pulled out or was this literally from the shore you went out yourself? No, we dropped in some jet skis up the coast and because of the crazy direction, we didn't know exactly where it was going to be on. There was one spot in particular that was really good about, uh, you know, in 2.11 for Cyclone Bianca 
And we knew that was, there was a good chance that that would be on, but we wanted to explore as well. So we put in jet skis probably 20 kilometres from that location, packed lunch, packed water, got another couple um, of jet skis with us and then started touring the coast, um, just searching for the perfect wave. But um, we ended up back up where we did, you know, in 2011 (laughs) because that was just, it was on fire. Uh, Just big, heavy... was that off the like, or like literally not far from the from the sh- like the shoreline, or were you actually more in deeper water? No, it was breaking on the shoreline. Hey, like oh, wow. literally, when you fell off, it was like probably knee deep water, oh, and oh, wow. uh, and it was really quite big. So when you fell off, it was it was amazing. Actually, you'd actually wash up onto the dry beach, and then there was people <laughs> there with iPhones filming, you know, as you're spitting out sand <laughs> kind of thing. And yeah, all the tripods. It was pretty amazing. It was like. Four drones, you know, no way. Ten, wow. ten tow teams, you know, three video guys. There was heaps of stills, wow. like a, probably one of the most well documented surfs in WA in ages. Wow, and ages. be some good pics coming out of that, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. The phone's been running hot all day with people sending around photos of the day. It's been yeah, pretty that's crazy. So cool. Wow, that's yeah. so, that is so cool, man. It's like you sort of creating yeah. your own like mini documentary slash movie. There, it's like it must be incredible yeah, footage. Or- it's yeah, just they have, they'd have so many angles, and it always happens. And this is the beauty and the bad side of uh, predicting weather. Everyone knows where to go nowadays, you know. So as yeah. soon as you take photos and then of a place, and then there's a swell event predicted, just everyone comes together. So there's there's not many places left where you can keep a secret and just try to go there with yourself nowadays. Yeah, it's uh, that is unfortunate. Yeah, you're one of the locals, though, so you get to uh, flex a little bit of that local muscle, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I'm probably not <laughs> to, to be honest. I try to play nice, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, because it's it changes the whole atmosphere in the water. Yeah. Like, if, if you get a couple of idiots out there that are trying to get more waves than others or being a bit selfish, it probably uh, just changes the, not a hippie, but changes the vibe in the water, yeah. you know, so yeah. it's. If, you, if you're out there smiling and just taking it in turns, then everybody gets a, a good run and everyone's happier then. So I, I really try to promote other people going as well, you know. I'll, I'll want to cool. see them get as good one as me. So. Yeah. yeah. That's good because you often like, I don't know, I mean, I'm not a surfer. I love the sea. I don't surf, but like I always hear from mates that do. Like it's quite a territorial thing from the sounds of it. You know, you get some guys like, do not even try come surf our waves because we will beat you up. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, whoa, it does. It happens know. quite a bit. Yeah. Bit of bit of the reason behind that is sometimes is just safety as well, though. Like um, sometimes you get people who don't have good water etiquette and they don't know the rules of what to and what not to do. So say you'll have a surfer that's just about to travel on a wave and he's going to travel that way. Water etiquette says this guy shouldn't go, you yeah. know. But sometimes if this guy doesn't know the etiquette and he's new to surfing, he'll go and drop in and then potentially there'll be a board and a body yeah. wrapped up you know, with surfboards and fins flying around. So sometimes that can be lead to a few uh, yeah. a few Barneys and the rest of it for sure. Yeah, Barneys. I love that word Barneys. Yes, I haven't. <laughs> I reckon I haven't heard Barney since high school. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, yes, that's a great word. <laughs> In my little, in the little surf, talking about little surfer towns where I grew up in Port Elizabeth, where there were people like to think there were waves, but they weren't really. The, the local is... pub on the beach it, it was called Barney's, so probably that's why. <laughs> oh, I know Barney's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So, Shannon, sorry, did you say your wife is actually South African from PE? Yeah, yeah, she's from PE. So, oh, you're yeah. kidding me. I didn't know. She... Wow. No. How is it? I only just found out just the other day. I've got a little nine-month-old, or we have a little nine-month-old daughter. I only just found out that she's part South African. I only just put the pieces what? together. <laughs> no <laughs> way. Wait a minute. What have, I, what have I done here? Oh, what have you done, mate? Yeah. Well, you've got some good genes there, but that's good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I've got a... Uh, We've got to accept the whole South African thing now into my life. Oh, the whole pause and yeah. and yeah. PE. I mean, he's even on another level, man. So you you're a lucky guy. <laughs> yeah, they rave about it. Their whole family. They had a little place down in Nature's Valley, I think it was. Uh, oh yeah, uh, beautiful. It's up there as well, and they everyone has super fond memories of that. Yeah, for sure. Have you ever surfed um, super tubes or? No, or I'm actually never across there. 
to be honest. Um, no. My wife has been trying to drag me since I've met her, but um, to be honest, I'm scared. Um, <laughs> it's kind of the reason why there's a lot of South Africans coming our way um, yeah. is to Australia um, is kind of it seems like everyone's had a bit of a run in, you know, that has been yeah. almost life like all of Heather's family, like her dad, the reason she immigrated across was he got held up twice, yeah. um, mm-hmm. gun to the head. I think so it was kind of, yeah, I'm scared to take my wife and my little daughter across there, sure. to be honest. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, or just, I'm not street savvy either. Like in Australia, I know what's going on, but I just, I'm not born and bred over that way. So unless, yeah. unless a bit of company, yeah. a bit of male company, sure. I, 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 mean, I, I would say like, to be honest with you, like d- don't necessarily let a lot of the people's stories um, deter you because it is a beautiful place to go and visit. And generally when yeah. you go on holiday, honestly, like, I mean, you know, the chances of stuff happening are, are very few and far between. And it is a great place to go on holiday. Um, the people are amazing. Everyone has said that. Yeah. And everyone has. Yeah. And bud, you got to go surf J Bay, bud. Like, oh, I mean, J Bay! I was going to say J Bay has been on the list for years. So, yeah. yeah, I definitely <laughs> should. Yeah. Do, do you have many Safa friends in in Perth? Because uh, I'm or like you know Margaret River. Because I, I know a lot of um, South Africans are there. Actually, my family is there yeah. too. Uh, they oh, yeah. uh, they they've, they've lived there for like I don't know since I was like I don't know. Uh, really really young they've been there over 20 years basically my uncles and stuff yeah it's a beautiful you would have spent a bit of time over here then for sure totally but yeah you have the most amazing sunsets in perth ever it's magic and watching the sun fall down over the water is just yeah on the west coast it's beautiful hey absolutely beautiful yeah absolutely and margaret river is also known for something else i think uh yeah, a li- a also a liquid waves <laughs> down here and a bit of good wine for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of my red as well so that's cool yeah, yeah definitely it's... a good 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 happy medium with waves and wine down here for sure good co- a good combination man <laughs> yeah definitely so shannon just to give this chat a little bit of context for our les- listeners um yeah recently i was chatting to a mutual friend of ours ado and he was saying yeah oh, good old I got a mate staying with me and you just got to chat to him. He's just had this super interesting story and, uh, and he's here to, to serve. I think that was when you were probably, like you said earlier, like down to her to serve some of that, that swell. That yeah. Was on the I bounced over for a swell over the East coast a few weeks ago and was doing a bit of shark eye stuff over there as well. So yeah, that's, Brilliant. I got in touch with Ado, but I didn't quite get to go see him, unfortunately. Oh, you didn't I get was, to see him? Oh. No, nah, we spoke on the phone a couple of times, but I was shooting south when he was up north there in Burley, I think. So. Oh, well, either way, he got the ball in motion for us to have this chat. So, you know, thanks yeah, Ado nice. for that. <laughs> yeah, cheers, Ado. So, um, you know, we, we, as part of our chats, we like to just get to know you a little bit better, like where you're coming from and where you grew up and what have you. So give us a yeah. little bit of a sort of a, a synopsis of what life was like for you growing up in uh, right, Western pull, Australia and uh, pull, a little bit about your family and upbringing. Pull up your pipe and set of slippers. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a bad story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm um, West Aussie, born and bred. Uh, down in Esperance is my hometown. Um, it's probably eight hours. I don't know if you know where Perth is. You would have a bit of an idea there. Yeah, yeah. It's pro- eight hours south, so right at the start of the Great Australian Bight. So really remote town, probably 15,000 people in population. Um, yeah, so just small town, brought up, family of five children, um, mum, dad, uh yeah and just kind of that was where life begun very very simple existence in a little country town just started surfing super early age and we we lived right on the water pretty much so ev- all of our activities were kind of water based so just in enjoyed the water since a you know really early age and then kind of as life has progressed on just kept on progressing and progressing with sports and work probably down down that path a little bit as well. It's probably me, yeah, very quick little entry yeah. into it, mate. And and your your siblings, like, are they older, younger than you, brothers, sisters? Yeah, I had one older brother. Um, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. Um, and then I have a sister. Oh, that's that's all good. 
um, yeah, a sister and then two two younger brothers also. Yeah, so there's five of us five of us in total down down to four now, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And your older brother served as as quite a role model to you guys as uh, as his siblings. Is that right? Yeah, he set the standard for sure. Yeah. Like he uh, um he died quite uh, quite young. He died at 25. Um, but he was just yeah, he was you know good looking guy. You know had uh, yeah just had had a lot going on kind of. And uh, you know it's great great little surfer. He used to compete quite a bit. Um, mm. did, did well, you know, um, in surfing and the rest of it. And yeah, and just was, you know, it was great, great fun, always having a laugh and always giggling. So it was, yeah, it was a good, always taking us out fishing and dragging us along to the beach yeah. till we got to the, about the age of 15. And then the, you know, then it kind of, uh, slowed down a little bit because he, he got a little bit cool for a couple of years, but yeah, <laughs> the, the younger brother was kind of hassling him out a little bit to, for a bit too much, I think, but yeah, no, it was great. And that lifestyle was pretty much all down in Esperance. And we moved a little bit around the coast as well, down to Bunbury and Bustleton, which is a bit more back towards Perth and then even up to Carnarvon in Northwest. Anyway. So yeah, we've done, moved around quite a bit around. West Oz as well had a good look around. And uh, what did what do your folks do, or did they do at the time? Um, my dad, he's kind of done a couple of bits and pieces, but mostly is in the building trade. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of the majority of what what he's he's done in his days. And, cool. and so, and and you you did a little bit of that yourself every now and again. You did like when you were a youngster, a little bit of like the odd yeah. job and that kind of thing. From the age of probably, I left school when I was 15. Um, we kind of, once again, the, the little country town and kind of we weren't really encouraged at all to, you know, get secondary education. Um, so, yeah, I just moved into a bit of building work and then a little bit of abalone diving and pretty much just made money doing whatever I could for a little while just to be able to go surfing and go <laughs> fun my little surfing habits at the time. So it was probably, yeah, it was probably mid-20s by the time I started to slow it down a little bit, I guess, and actually start taking life maybe a little bit more seriously kind of and trying to yeah. look towards careers and that kind of thing, yeah. So so what about um, like your, your brothers and sisters as well? Did they, did they also like leave school sort of at a young age and – um, go do stuff that was, you know, interesting to them? Yeah, no, all of us left pretty early. Um, we were brought up quite religious and it kind of probably wasn't really encouraged to move down that path too far. Um, so I guess all my siblings followed a similar suit and kind of left school early. And then, yeah, just most of them now are uh, in, in the building trade or moved on to little personal businesses and, yeah, my sister ended up going back to uh, university a little bit later on in life um, and studying marine science. And she oh, cool. moved, yeah, it was awesome. Like uh, she moved down to Tasmania and started studying barramundi um, down there and how light affects the behavior of barramundi. So she actually wow. made quite a good good breakthrough with that um, as far as increasing growth rates of barramundi down there. So she's went whole hog and did her phd and the rest of it and wow. dr Amazing. Kristen perks nowadays married to <laughs> a, guy, a friend of mine down in esperance but yeah she's she's an amazing woman actually she's a really amazing mm. woman she's um yeah just a bit of a rock and just yeah you know the kind of uh sometimes uh, you've we've probably all got these mates you wouldn't want your sister with them or you wouldn't want your brother with those mates, you know? she's the kind of girl that you know you'd be really happy for for someone to end up with she's yeah that's cool, she's man. nice nice that's girl. a good person that's cool yeah, and, I, really nice. and i guess you 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 have like a lot in uh in common now you know like you know with um what you're doing and you know with her studying sort of marine science Massively. and stuff. It's like, she's yeah. done so much research for us and you know we've been able to tap into her um because i'm not the academic i'm more of a hands-on kind of guy. my experience and knowledge has come probably from more of a hands-on practical application of a lot of things like actually you know anecdotal yeah. evidence and being in the water with with all different things whereas she's got 
that mixed in with the scientific background as well. So it's it's been great for her to be able to actually, um, I don't know if contextualise is the word, but, you know, be yeah. able to actually formulate the science aspect and, and really help help us out with research. So she's been amazing through the whole thing for sure. Uh, that's cool. It's shark eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and talking about, you know, talking about shark eyes and, and sort of your practical experience of all that. So you, like you said, you've pretty much always been a water person. Um, so you've done things like, uh, I mean, you, were, you did a lot of fishing, abalone you spoke about, spear fishing, uh, free diving, like you've done really cool stuff. So, I mean, yeah, each one of those are quite kind of interesting to me. Uh, but yeah. uh, I, I guess that's where all that practical experience come from. You just, you've lived your life, you know, very much yeah, in the water. And I didn't think it was anything abnormal, to be honest, when I was growing up, um, because, you know, you're in this little country town and you're pushing your ability um, and pushing your ability. But there's no reference points, you know, like yeah. even today, I, it's, you know, I'm probably around the scene a little bit more in the surfing scene. So you catch catch on what's going on and where people are pushing themselves. But 20 years ago, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost 40. <laughs> so it's, 20 years ago, there wasn't there wasn't that, many, you know, so we we were just pushing our ability in this little country town and we just thought it was normal what we were doing. So it was only until we probably jumped out of that arena a little bit more and then realized that okay we're we're probably pushing it as hard as anybody is in a few of those fields you know so and then a few years later um i sought out or a few years later probably about five or six years ago um sought out a bit of training on the breath hold and apnea side of things um which has led me to uh one ocean international a guy called joe knight um He's just the once again the nicest guy around who teaches a passive form of apnea, uh, which, through all the research I've done, is the only way to to try to get into I think a lot of guys try to force the issue. And you know, unlike you know, I'll give a quick example. Like you know, mostly when you grab weights, you know, yeah. and you're trying to get results, the harder you mm. push and the more you hurt, the bigger you're going to get and the bigger your results. But with breath hold and apnea, you've really got to retrain your mind because um, at the moment, the majority of people, um, they have a bad feeling towards CO2 build up. So instantly that makes them, you know, you get mm. that urge and you, you don't enjoy it. Um, and if you try to push through that with forced apnea or you try too hard, you're actually just training your body that this is not a good feeling and you're not enjoying it you know so you're really just reinstating that fact that this is not a good thing so if you just go into apnea or breath hold free diving just with a passive outlook um not competitive you know can't bring any ego to the table or anything like that you then slowly and but surely if you don't push yourself too hard the results just come naturally so you just wow. explore a little bit past your boundary but then as soon as it feels uncomfortable, you come up, you know, so it's it's a lot safer. And then that way there too, you're actually retraining your body to go, okay, well, this feeling of CO2 build up is not actually a bad experience. So I can, you, you end up enjoying, enjoying the fact that you yeah. don't have breath, which oh. comes in handy when you're a uh, yeah. big wave surf. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, sure. for sure. Yes, yeah, so, so, so like with the... Um, the free diving, like like how far are you sort of going down and how long are you holding your breath for? I mean, geez. Yeah, like the free diving, like I'm, once again, I use it for like a more practical application to put food on the table. Like I do a lot of spear fishing nowadays um, and I train with uh, One Ocean International and help them train. We just did um, a few of the local schools. We did about 60 students um, down here just uh, last week actually. Um but I don't push my free diving for depth. Um, that's not okay. how I utilize it. After after you hit the 30 meter mark, your lungs hit residual volume. So, do you know the old diving analogy uh, where there's one atmosphere of air, 10 meters of water? To, no, but ex explain it to us, please. Yeah. Okay, so you've got water to space, which you know is classified as an atmosphere. So 10 meters of water weighs the same as 
as that atmosphere. Okay. So if you have a balloon and you take it 10 meters under, yeah. it'll halve its size because of the weight on it. Okay. So at 20 meters, it'll be three times, uh, sorry, a third of its size. Yeah. So then at 30 meters, it's, you know, down thing. So at 30 meters, your lungs actually hit residual volume. Ah. Um, and so therefore, after that point, they fill up with blood to... Uh, what's you know to cater for that because yeah. there's no more cavity wow. there, so it's a bit of a horrible feeling and a totally different kettle of fish after you go below 30 meters. Um, so my, you know, I don't mind hanging at around 30 or 28, wow. but like, <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, go past. Whereas you know Joe Knight and these other guys are just freaks. They, you know, I think the world record's 105 or something rather for a free. Jeez, it's so so crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and that's that's next level kind of stuff. So I'm I'm not pushing it in that level. Um, I'm probably just pushing it for for practical purposes, really. But I think but you, it's such a sorry. Yeah, you're probably underestimating it there, like or, or not <laughs> under talking or whatever. But like thirty meters, like with uh, yeah. sort of it is super deep. Even when like normal, you know, like normal people like say myself and Craig Put your we flippers go, like, on and <laughs> you go like to yeah. five meters at that steep guess, you know so yeah it's probably i guess it is who you hang around once again yeah. you know like yeah. I'm, if i'm hanging around with joe like joe knight he's you know he's deep is oh yeah 50 60 and then it's starting to you know starting to push it a little bit and then the company he keeps they're talking 80s and 90s and it's kind of like oh so yeah. Shows, yeah. It changes the bar, hey, it raises that bar when you hang around those certain people and they're that are top of their game. Definitely. And more than anything is just learning good technique, you know. When you get to tune in to the guys that are absolute pros in their sport, the handy hints they give you are just they let you lift your bar up massively. Wow. So it's yeah, it's fan fantastic to be able to have that guy down here and be able to train with him because he can definitely pass on some gems, that's for sure. But it must, I mean, I've heard such interesting stories about free diving in general and I think it's quite an interesting thing to explore. Like you said, it's a big head game, like, um, and all in, all in the mind, like a lot of, and, and lot also of like when you're under the water and, and sort of your heart rate slowing down and you, you kind of in a, in a comfortable state, Look, I, I've mm. never obviously done this, but I just imagine, like what I've read and stuff. It's like almost like you're going back to a, like your evolutionary roots or something primal like your state. heart rate. Have yeah, you, a real primal yeah. state. And have you heard of the mammalian dive reflex at all or not? Yes, that's that's, that's, that's what, what I was going to come to. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy. And so, so what is, can you explain what what that is? Yeah, MDR, or quite often it's referred to now as just uh, DR, the dive reflex, or the mammalian dive reflex. Um, do you want to hear a little story? Yeah, There's a crazy yeah, little story. <laughs> this will, yeah, this will be good. So um, I'm not going to tell it to its T, so you'll just have to, uh, you know. <laughs> I've heard it a few times. Yeah, imagine a little bit. So there was this guy, I think it was like 1903, over in Greece, and there was, um, there was a warship that pulled into the bay, um, Haggy Staddy. That's his name. Haggy Staddy. Haggy, <laughs> Haggy Staddy. Um, he was the local spear fisherman there. Um, and, you know, he was renowned around the town as being being the man in the water. And uh, so anyway, this warship pulled in. They dropped anchor and they lost their anchor. And it was in whatever war they were having. So please forgive my ignorance of history. It's, I've learned this for the uh, Haggy Staddy story. Um, yeah, so they lost their anchor. And then so they had to get their anchor back. It was wartime. It was like, we, we need this thing. So anyway, they asked around the local town, employed the services of Haggy Staddy, and he was like six foot three. He was like 70 kilos. He was the full smoker. He was just the most <laughs> healthy man in the universe. And apparently his like resting heart rate was like 90 or something crazy. <laughs> so just this crazy beat up guy. Um, but the reports were that he'd done like 80 and 90 meter dives. And wow. this anchor had gone missing in 76 metres of water. And this is documented, Jeez. so this is not – I'm rough with it's my – It's not a uh, story, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it's not a story. This is yeah. actually documented. And anyway, so they employed his services. And then over the next three days, long story short, he proceeded to go down and do these 75-metre dives over and over again and tied on – that had a big marble or a big granite rock with a rope on 
yeah. and he'd hold on to it and then I'd send him down Jeez. and then he tied the rope onto the anchor and they retrieved it. So the point being, it's like, how did this happen? You know, this guy that's so beat up, six foot four, with oh, emphysema God. or something, brother, in the open <laughs> position, just gone, this guy can't be doing this, you know. But this is where the mammalian diaper effects kicks in. And it's like it actually triggers with CO2, cold water, and pressure. It triggers, like you were saying, like a primal instinct, which instantly halves your heart rate. So your heart wow. rate drops below 40 beats a minute. Wow. And then with that as well, there's a selective vasoconstriction. So basically your blood vessels, and you can feel this. It's really amazing. Like wow. uh, all of us have got this too. It's not just, uh, you know, yeah. divers or freak. All, all humanity has it. So you can actually feel it when you're doing a static breath hold, um, when you calm yourself. You know, with a static breath hold is with your head down in the water, just in a passive environment, um, not in a working environment. Mm. Um, yeah, and you actually feel the blood rush out of your arms and out of your legs wow. because it goes to your vital organs, it goes to your heart and your brain to keep those things active. So, yeah, that's part of the dive reflex anyway. Yeah. Jeez, so it's, wow. it's, it's amazing. So we actually have a physiological response to cold water and breath hold and CO2 wow. build up. So, yeah. I, you, so you know what? Rambling bit. No, that's, that, that's so cool, man. I, I, we love it. Like, um, but you know, it, it reminds me actually when I was a kid, my mates and I, we used to do this thing like we would like you'd go down almost on like your haunches and you'd put your head down and you'd like breathe <laughs> deeply, like, you know, <laughs> and then, and, and, then you'd, and then, and then you'd come and you'd stand up and, and a mate, he would like grab you here, like in your sort of, yeah. uh, what, what, like your, whatever this is called, <laughs> um, your yeah. throat and, and you'd just, and then you'd pass out and out. it's yeah. like, it was crazy when you think of it, like what you were doing. Yeah, I like, remember doing that at school. Yeah. And, and guys would like be out for like minutes and we'd be doing it in class and it would be like, hey, wake <laughs> him up, wake him up. <laughs> it's crazy. It's so now I know it. why you yeah. are like yeah. you are. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> his head has been dropped a lot of times, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. But uh, sorry, Shannon, do you, um, do you practice any sort of other cold water therapy or breathing techniques like say Wim Hof and not sure if you've um, come across him at all. Um, do you do any anything like that? No, I just definitely other breathing techniques. Like um, one of the main breathing techniques is just recovery breathing. I don't know if you've heard of that. A lot of the divers use it, yeah. um, which is basically just a forced inhale, passive exhale, and this basically allows you to ram oxygen into you as fast as possible. Um, if you can imagine, if you're just going. It's not. Yeah. It's not really forcing the oxygen out, you know, from your lungs out into the bloodstream. Yeah. Whereas if you actually, yeah, you know, you can feel that pressure build up. You feel it in your lungs, and it's pushing it out. Um, so just little little things like that, mm. like with the recovery breathing, is massive. Like you put that into a working environment, um, i.e., in big wave surfing, or you can imagine you have a big wave come down. It's yeah. You're under for a certain amount of time. Your head comes up. And then you've only got maybe five or ten seconds sometimes before the next one hits. Yeah. So you really have to pump that oxygen into you as fast as possible because oh. sometimes there might be four or five of those. Yeah. So those like recovery breathing we definitely practice and it's you've really got to do it so much that it becomes your default um, because in those situations where you're really reliant on it, you're not thinking anymore. Yeah. So it needs to be just instinctively happening totally. so yeah definitely train a heap with with the breathing techniques that i'm aware of and i know work we we do a fair bit with that for sure yeah that's crazy so like you, you know what you know what i just love like i love chatting to like you know guys like you that are sort of experts in what you do because what you realize is that everything is an art do you know what i mean like literally <laughs> Everything, yeah. if you want to do it properly, it, it is an art. And you have to respect what anybody does in this world. If it's, like you said, someone surfing or someone who, you know, picks up the rubbish or whatever it is, like there is totally an art to it and we need to really be respectful of what people do because it's quite amazing. Yeah, and to be able to remain safe with a lot of the activities too, it's definitely, you, you need training. Like there's a lot of, 
um, younger guys nowadays. You can imagine you get a bit of a rush of blood and a few photos get flicked around and then there's a little bit of media hype around it and the rest of it. And, you know, I used to be a young buck as well. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, you used to enjoy, you know, that, that kind of thing a little bit. Um, but the guys that want to make a name for themselves – you know, in, in the field of surfing, they're yes. willing to put themselves in really dodgy situations yeah. to get those photos. So it, it really is something that we're pushing um, over in West Australia at the moment. The Hawaiians are really good um, and a lot of the international big wave surfers, they, they are really good. They really are a band of brothers that have come together, promoted water safety and everyone has looked after themselves. But we probably do need a bit more of that here in Australia because there's there is quite a few of the up and coming guys pushing a bit too hard probably for their capabilities, you know, or for their training. Yeah. So yeah, yeah definitely. It's definitely the side of surfing that maybe the average um, Joe on the street doesn't always see. Like you don't necessarily think about that. Like you actually might need to do some actual training for the safety aspect, and it's not just. I'm a good surfer, get into massive, massive surf, you know, like, so do, no, do, like, do the famous blokes out there, like, I don't know, obviously Kelly Slater and these kinds of people, do they like do a bit of that kind of promotion? Uh, do they like, number one the, and number two, how do those blokes like stay um, surfing and charging big, sur big waves? Like, how do they keep that up? It must be pretty hard on the body talking about how tough it is. Yeah, definitely. It, it, Big wave surfing has progressed so much, though, just in the last five five years even. Um, I guess it all changed with jet skis um, in the Laird Hamilton, Derek Doner kind of days um, where they implemented jet skis on. And then since then, it kind of blew everyone away at what man was doing. And then, you know, it moved on to now it's come back around full circle where paddling is kind of what all the big guns are trying to do. And it's almost starting to tick around again that toe surfing is coming back around again um, just due to equipment and the rest of it. So it's it's definitely done a big <coughs> full cycle of what what has gone around. I've just, I've just forgotten your question a little bit though too. I've just, and uh, about, just about the longevity. Like, like how, oh, do yeah, these, longevity. How, do these, how do you guys it's keep it up? What do you do to look after your body? Yeah, this is the thing. Ten years ago, they did nothing. They probably got out of the surf and drank beer and went <laughs> yeah. home again. You know? So ten years, in the last ten years, it's changed a heap. Um, whereas, you know, I like I said, the training, I only sought training out and I've been big wave surfing, I guess, for maybe ten years or 15 years, pushing it to probably a bit higher level. Wow. Um, and I only sought out training five years ago. So it was maybe 34 um, yeah. so it's, it's only just kind of the sport has got to that where it's only the elite guys that are making a good income off it, um, that have the time and the availability, I guess, almost to focus on every aspect of their surfing. And they've actually become elite athletes nowadays. Like their training regime is yoga, stretching, breath hold. Um, yeah, just all, all facets of, of what they're doing. So, and then the safety equipment too has improved a ridiculous amount. Um, we've got flotation devices. We've got hard foam that goes under our wetsuits. Um, the technology of surfboards has got better. and But all this technology has only really been in the last three years probably that this has been available to wow. the big wave guys. So it's it's become a lot more safer and the guys are taking it a lot more serious. But also the situations where we're putting ourselves yeah. are getting a lot more serious too. It, the bar is just... Yeah. Isn't dramatic, mm. so it's it's crazy. I don't know if you've seen a big wave spot in Portugal called Nazaré. Yeah, uh, Garrett McNamara blew it out of the water probably about five years ago with yeah. one massive wave, and it was just yeah. like whole surfing community just went, "Holy moly, what's going on here?" Yeah, and uh, yeah, and since then that's probably been almost the focal point of the highest wave in the world. Um, but it's so treacherous. It's it's crazy wow. the amount of water that that place just moves around. But isn't it something ridiculous, like 60 meters or something? Or was it, was it that big? I mean, it was massive. Oh, probably it? not quite that big, yeah. It was, I think it might have been like 80 feet or something or other. Okay. So maybe, Still yeah, maybe 30 meters or something crazy. Like, yeah. Or it was like this big and the guy's like this big. It's, it's, it's crazy, mad. those pictures. Absolutely, oh, man. Ridiculous. Oh, 
Yeah, so it's it kind of I'm I enjoy getting tubed a bit more. Um, yeah. You know, what getting tubed is you know being being amongst all yeah. the all the water, feeling sound. Whereas the big the consequence of that there of a wave that big <laughs> for the reward is just not, not there for me. So yeah, oh, I, God. this guys can have that one. Yeah, for sure. And can we can we just talk? Sorry about it. Go no, for it. You, no, no, yeah. I was just wondering, is there any like crossover at all between? say you boys and the snowboarders and stuff like when it comes to safety equipment um do you guys you know what i mean like because it sounds like yeah some not, of this stuff is quite similar that you might use yeah not safety equipment because it's all really yeah all really really diff on a similar aspect but yeah. yeah no just specifically for you know for the surfing aspect for sure but there is one crazy uh german that's giving the big wave scene a real hard nudge um sebastian Struner, <laughs> and he's got a he's pretty much hasn't surfed and then he you know um has entered big wave surf in the world of big <laughs> wave surfing um and he's you know catching these massive things i think he's won the biggest wave in the world two years what? consecutively or something crazy <laughs> and i i had a conversation with him and i was like so what do you you know so how did you get into this and what do you you know same questions you know, how do you train and he just goes i only need to know two things he goes <laughs> psh, psh. <laughs> And that's his inflation vest that he's using. So it's like, <laughs> no way. So he's, yeah, he's come from a snowboarding background. He's thrown on a vest and he's just gone and taken out pretty much the, or he has taken out the biggest documented waves in the world for like wow. two years. Wow. It's crazy. That's pretty commendable, yeah. actually. So, yeah, it's nuts. So he's gone and utilized his skills and he was obviously a bit of a madman on the snow, snow slopes and he, Jeez. yeah, jumped on, think, jumped behind the rope and gone for I, it. I think there's something, Shannon, look, I used to like bodyboard and surf back in the day a little bit. And I think if you've never been in like in the, in the ocean or not much, I don't think people realize how big a big wave is. You know, like, yeah. like I remember surfing like eight foot waves and thinking literally that this was the last day of my life. Like, <laughs> it's that scary, like eight feet and like, you know, like it's a freaking joke, you know. Yeah. So like, I think it's like, how, how can you sort of explain to people what it feels like when you're in big surf and, and give us a sort of a taste of, of what it's like to be out there when it's really big? Yeah. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing is it's like after it hits a certain size, you are not in control anymore. You know, it's the ocean will humble any man you know so it's uh, i definitely have a very healthy respect for the ocean and it it's just it's cr it's crazy you know the forces that you know we've all seen tsunamis and we've seen you know you've felt big waves that are so big the the power that is behind it and the rest of it so when those water volumes are just we're talking are absolutely massive it's you, you, you've just got to accept that you're not in control anymore um, of the situation. But uh, with big wave surfing, I guess in particular, um, it's you've just the game is. You know how they say quite often the game's won or lost before the actual game day, yeah. and it's very much like that. You need to be on good equipment. You need to, you know, have your safety team. You need to have your vest, a good wetsuit. You know make sure your fins are in nice and tight so they're not going to wobble, you know, have a good tow rope, have towed with the guy if you're going to, if it's going to be the, um, you know, in the direction of tow surfing. Know the guy that you're with and towed with. Hopefully you've done a bit with him before. Be up to date with your, you know, CPR and all that kind of thing because it is going to happen at some stage. Like, um, yeah, the, the ocean will always win. There will always be injuries. Mm people will go down so you just need to be equipped as much as you can to be able to when that situation does occur um to be able to handle it and then hopefully you've done everything you can so it ends up in a semi-controllable kind of situation and it's not just out of control and you've you've lost it you know 
So yeah, so a lot of there's a lot of prep and thought mm. and everything goes into it. Or well, for me, it does anyway. For a few young bucks, sure. it might not. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting older. The German a bit uh, big wave surfer, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I hope, I hope, I hope Sebastian uh, has done a little bit since then, but he, he probably has. He, he should be getting enough so, money and time to uh, go yeah. do it. I think. So so bad luck. Like, um... This, like just can you just help explain like you know when you because i mean i've only been on normal size waves you know what i mean and i kind of know like how to get out of them but is it is it probably the exact same technique uh you know of like when you oh, when you or is it how does it work because i when you see yeah, how, those I'll, things they just overtake you completely yeah like, i don't know how you'd ever get out of it I'll give you an explanation. One of my favourite waves is down on the south coast of Australia. It comes out of like about 35 metres of water, so it's quite deep water, and then there's just an instant rock. So it comes out of the water, hits a rock, and just throws over hard. So it's not necessarily really high, yeah. but it just throws this massive barrel, and all of the water volume hits in the one spot. But it's just one rock, if you can imagine. I don't yeah. know if I'm... Um, got the gauge right on the screen so if yeah, you yeah. if you imagine yeah. the, the bottom of the screen is actually the bottom of the ocean yeah so all this water coming in is generating in it hits yeah. and then if you're down at the bottom of it it's already maybe 10 meters above the water level yeah and then you you get driven down and because the water comes over it, it cascades down under as well yeah so the actual violence and the turbulence that is happening, like your arms and legs feel like they want to be getting ripped off in different yeah. directions. And then quite often when the impact, you're moving fast quite often. So quite often your lungs will, yeah. you know, you'll yeah. lose your air. And then you go over the rock and then down the waterfall, down the underwater waterfall. So you potentially Jesus. can be instantly instantly 10 meters underwater yeah and you know the pressure that we're talking about so that's two atmospheres of air oh, so wow. your ears instantly want to blow your eardrums Jesus. so you've got to go for your eardrums straight away and then the underwater fall happens and you go down even deeper and you just go into the blackness so what? you've come in at like 60 kilometers an hour 60. if you fall in the wrong spot then you get a wipeout, which makes your arms and legs feel like it's absolutely getting ripped off you. And then you've got to deal with the underwater waterfall and the eardrums going and all the rest of it. It's it's hideous, to be honest. Wow. It's absolutely crazy, some of the wipeouts and, and the thoughts. Yeah, so it's it's heavy duty. Um, but, but being able to remain calm in that situation, and this is where yeah. the training is so important. Um, I don't know if you remember just earlier I was talking about with your CO2 tolerance, being able to actually enjoy the feeling, yeah. as crazy as that. So you're down there without any breath and you've got to just relax to a point and go, look, well, I've felt this before. I know what this CO2 feels like and I'm not actually scared of it. And then that way there, you hopefully get back to the Because as soon as you start panicking, even your mind, um, your brain uses 30% of your oxygen on, you know, on a percentage of, you know, your body levels are uh, things. So your brain's there. So as soon as you start stressing out, you're starting to chew into your oxygen. Then if you engage your big legs, your big muscles, like your hammies, then you're just chewing oxygen. Yeah. So you can't kick, you can't fight. You've just got to go to sleep. Like in that place, I've like, you've got, um, what am I looking for? Positive anchors. Yeah. I guess. Uh, and everyone has a different party of anchor that they go to. Like some guys, they'll have a song that they sing and you know, <laughs> it's over and over in their head or some people yeah. visualize being on holiday. Whatever it is that you've done before, you just do that. Mine's, mine's a bit more simple. I just try to go to sleep. Babe. No way. Like I, I shut my eyes and then go into the blackness, into the back of my eyeballs and just try to go to sleep. That's, and you're like that's a rag doll at this stage. You're basically being chucked yeah. around like crazy, but you're just like, I'm, sl I'm sleeping. I'm all right. And trying, trying to keep that mindset. It's, it sounds ridiculous, I do know, but yeah. it is the only way that you can deal with that situation is have those positive anchors or have where you go to to be able to remain calm in that situation. As soon as you let panic set in, you're, you're dusted pretty much. So. And that specific wave then, Shannon, do you – on that specific break, do you sort of make your way up 
uh, slowly but surely. But I would imagine if there's a set or something, I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you it's go from there? It's terrible. This one wave in particular, it's really hard to judge. Like I made some, I've been surfing it for maybe 10 years or so, but it's really different to anything else. There's not too many waves that send you that deep and have that much impact in the one spot. Um, a lot of waves push you a long distance. Um, whereas this one just goes down and then you, it holds you there. So uh, I made a mistake probably on the second year I was there. I got my inflation vest and I'd had enough of being down. Um, and remember, we initially we didn't have hard foam and we didn't have inflation vests. So it was just you came up when you came up. And now we have hard foam, which generally it gets you moving in the right direction, but it doesn't always work because the forces that – are working are way more powerful than a bit of foam. But the revolutionary change has been the eject button. So you push the, pull the cord, you, you know, massive air, and then bump straight up to the surface. And you can be up to the surface within five seconds. But the problem with that, <laughs> with that one is if, you, if you've done it too long, and at that wave in particular, you're actually straight under where the first one hit almost. Oh. So you push the button and you come straight back up the next hit one by another one. Oh. Is, so you've and if you've made that mental decision to press <laughs> to pull the eject button, you've already tapped out. Yeah. So it's, it's it's not a good thing. So you've really got to <laughs> when you're under there, got to either go. All right, I'm going to have two waves. I'm going to wait for two waves and then press the eject button, Ooh. or I'm going to pull it early nowadays and then try to get up to the surface to get oxygen before the next one hits. Yes. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's intriguing, like trying to explain this to the young guys when they first go surf it. This is what I'm saying, like the handy hints that yeah. you can get off the yeah. older guys being yeah, around massive. for the top. Invaluable, yeah. And, and, and I guess yeah. it's quite hard to like progress from like a normal sized wave to the ones you're doing. I mean, you know, it's not like you can have a training pool, you know. <laughs> we have this cool pool you can come and train now to get used to them. Like it's, uh, yeah, it's literally yeah. the deep end that you're in. <laughs> Yeah, the old uh, standing wave pool is not really going to cut it as far as getting you ready for a real life situation. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, yeah. You, you know what's you really interesting is that um, just listening to you speak, I reckon there's like there's so much value in like the way you talk about how to respond to stressful mm. situations. You know, and this is this is like transferable skills in ways that other people in different industries or sports, whatever, can also learn from. Is mm. there much of that we that you guys do? We do a little bit, and this is where Joe from One Ocean, like uh, under him, like you should have seen the course that we did um, with the kids. I think I was telling you we had 60 kids last week. And I, I haven't done a heap of teaching to kids before. Um, we normally do a specialist waterman program that caters for guys that are looking to push their barriers and they've already got a certain amount of fitness. You know, we give them a criteria that they need to be at a certain level before we'll take them through the actual training. Um, but just recently we took um, 60 students through and to be able to pass on like the things that we're talking about and using breathing techniques and um, mind control, I guess, yeah. uh, to a certain point. And being able to put that into a working atmosphere, um, it's really good we're relating it to breath hold and apnea and free diving for the kids so they can use it in that environment. Um, but then talking to them about, you know, whether it be bullying at school or exams or whatever the case yeah. is, to actually get them to consciously, because we lay them down on their back. Yeah get them to go into relaxation breathing and which, which is just through your stomach you know for um, passive inhale and then twice as long on the exhale just a bit of a you know yoga breathing i yeah. guess you would say um but just to get them to calm down and then get them to relate to the mindset that they came in with when the hustle and buzzle and bouncing yeah. over and then after about two minutes you can hear pin drops you know mm. just talk them through it and you can hear a pin drop and then we get them to slowly come up and relate to it. Like, look, just remember this feeling. It's like they open their eyes, you know, and everything's a bit brighter, you know. They've really relaxed yeah. out. It's walking through their happy place and beforehand and go, look, you know, shake it off, wriggle your chin, just get the stress out, whether it be a, you know, acoustic, you know, your favorite song, yeah. start singing. If you just want to go to sleep, if you want to listen to the water lapping, just 
go into it. And to see the calmness that they came up with um, and then to get them to relate to the hustle and bustle in their minds to where they were and then go, look, guys, this is going to be the biggest thing that I can impart to you is for the rest of your life, I wish I had somebody show me this. And yeah. to be able to take that place and that mindset as like, look, whether it's before an exam or, you know, yeah, if you break just... up with your boyfriend or whatever yeah, the case yeah. is, age, you know, to just be able to have a coping mechanism and uh, you can feel the change. Like it's undeniable. I'm not a hippie by any means, but you feel the change. If you lay on your back, use positive anchors, breathing techniques, and meditation as such, it's you you know the change. You can feel it. Yeah. So it's all of to be able to get those young guys and girls to actually feel that change and know that they can tap into that themselves and then utilize it and then we move it into a working environment in the free diving. But yeah, it was it was amazing. You should have heard um we got some you know just testimonials, I guess they're called the day after. Yeah. And it was these 15-year-old and 16-year-old guys and girls writing us messages saying how much of a life-changing experience it was. And that's, wow. that was amazing, you know, to be able to be a part of that. It's really made me want to go and teach more, to be honest. Yes, I'd, I'd yes. never thought about it before, but to actually see the impact that it had on those guys. <laughs> so cool. um, and I wish, I wish I had that outlet or had a, you know, couple of couple of handy hints from the older guys pointed sure. yeah. pointed out for me when it's here for sure yeah well you know well, what it's yeah. it's it's not it's not it's not hippie at all like you know in this day and age you know your brain and who you are and your mental faculty is is actually can be argued it's like the only real thing you can it's the only mm. thing you have a little bit of control over is yourself and so I think it's like super important uh, to to be teaching youngsters how to to take control of themselves in some way, and that's a really good start. Like mindfulness, being aware of whatever, and uh, so I think it's really super valuable stuff that you're doing. So that's yeah, really cool, they, you know. They would have never have tapped into before too the actual feelings that they're actually having. So even with the breath hold, you try to relate it when they do a breath hold in that relaxed kind of state to go, look, I'm going to ask you some questions after about what's actually going on in your body. Where are you feeling the pressure tighten up, you know? You you know, you feel it in your yeah. throat a little bit and you feel, you know, contractions a little bit. And uh, to get them to actually think about what they're feeling and what they're thinking and actually digest it, it's they've probably never done it before, a lot of them, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's good, good to get them to be able to talk and it's probably nice to – because I've, I guess I've done a bit of surfing and I'm a big wave surfer, uh, it's nice to be able to for them to go, all right, well, this guy's yeah. coming in with any ego and he's kind of talking about his feelings a little bit as well. So it's yeah. nice to be able to actually get those young guys and girls out of the comfort zone and go, look, no, tell us how you're feeling. It's fine, you know, and then yeah. go through their fears and, you know, so what, what actually scares you, you know, because we're going to use these techniques in every approach to life with what is it. So I was going, yeah, loved it. Absolutely loving, loving that aspect of it for yeah. sure. Well, but I mean, I don't actually think of, I could think of anyone better to learn from, like, besides like someone like yourself, you know, for what, what you've done. It's a, it's amazing. And you do come across as like such a great guy. And like you said, you know, you're, you're happy to show to the sort of emotional right? side and, and it's, <laughs> it, it comes naturally to you, but I can see you must flip and do more of it. It's awesome, man. So yeah, so great stuff. you know, I'm really, really enjoying. Yeah, really enjoying it. So hope, hopefully, some younger crew can learn from my mistakes. That's for sure. And yeah. Nice to, nice to be passing that on. Yeah, yeah. of yeah. course, man. Yeah, and uh, so, so like one of the other things that you that you also sort of grew up doing was uh, abalone fishing, and yeah, I, I think that's super fascinating because. I was like doing a little bit of sort of research on it and and the market for it is massive like the and the yeah. costs of of you it's know what big dollar industry yeah if yeah. you they were saying like if you're in the Sydney casino you'll buy one of them for a hundred and twenty dollars like yeah it's crazy it's crazy hey? yeah. yeah most of the market it all goes to China and Japan yeah I think um 
Japan, from what I understand, has a bit of a black market deal, do they, okay. with China? I don't yeah. know if you know about this. So everything goes to Japan first and then gets shuffled under the border somehow. I, <laughs> I think that's just how business is done over there. But, yeah, so I think the majority goes to, to Japan first and then into China. But, yeah, it's crazy. The dollar value of, of the industry is nuts, Yeah, absolutely nuts. There, there was – there's some other um, – like medicinal purpose for them in in some of those countries apparently um to the effect of like an aphrodisiac or something like that uh, yeah. as far as i understand and i think that's where the the black market side of it comes in because i know uh, for yep, example yep. in port elizabeth where i grew up there was a big problem of um we call them the okay. moon in south africa uh, and well the abalone they actually got abalone poachers who yeah. Who would come in and just like just take everything and and yeah like they were actually like a gang there like no one messed with them mm. and I knew people that were like eighteen nineteen who would like buy a freaking BMW cash and stuff because they were making yeah. so much money um, but illegally you know and yeah. uh, so it's quite an interesting sort of thing to to to, to consider and in in Australia I guess it's very well regulated and there's um, <laughs> You know? Yeah, 20 years ago there was a bit of poaching, but it's pretty ironed out nowadays. Um, yeah, I heard the stocks over in Africa though are just they decimated now because of the poaching yeah. as well. Yeah, because it was uh, such a you know lucrative thing that uh, it's just yeah been absolutely decimated. But it's they have yeah. a lot of aquaculture over there. Yeah. I think they're almost pumping out as much. Um, Aqua farm stock is what is coming out wild stock almost now. So. Cause it's quite okay. hard. They do row eye over there. I've got a couple of abs. Here's one I prepared earlier. This is abalone. Oh, wow. This is what we're talking about, guys. Wow. So wow. these yeah. two, the big one. two versions. Yeah, the little ones are what they mostly do over in South Africa, and they're called row eye. Um, and the bigger ones are green lip or black lip, brown lip. Um, yeah, so their aqua, aquaculture over there is farming row eye. And the row I live over in Australia here, um, if you can imagine the worst place to jump in the water, uh, you know, with waves bashing up on the rocks, yeah. that's where the most abalone are. So it's, <laughs> it's crazy, you know. So the factory would ring up and go, hey, we need this amount of abalone. And then you'd look at the weather forecast and go, oh, my goodness, <laughs> you know? we've got to go and jump in and get bashed against the rocks. Whereas the aquaculture over in uh, South Africa now, they can make the phone call, walk to walk out to the pool out the back, and <laughs> ship them off the thing. So it's, I think they've kind of done done really well as far as that's gone. Wow. So how do you protect yourself when you like getting bashed against the rocks all the time? It's oh man, it's heavy duty once again. And yeah. this is probably you know how it's a natural progression with surfing and all this kind of thing. It's like we've spent a lot of time you know in in and around the water. And so when we're abalone diving, we use, you know, obviously you have a, you know, bit of a helmet on, you have your booties on, but you don't actually use flippers. When you're going in to get the little variety, these, yeah. these bad boys, um, like I said, they're in that high impact zone. Uh, so you actually put a wetsuit on, you put a weight belt on, and you put a lead vest on to actually weight you down. So then wow. you run a hooker hose, and so you're breathing out of compressed air from the surface. And then you're actually moonwalking no along way. the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so you're really heavy. You're weighted up with all this weight and you're really heavy so that when the wave hits you, it moves you a little bit slower. Like if you were light and buoyant, obviously it's really going to rattle you around. So you're grabbing onto rocks, you know, as the wave hits, chipping a few off, holding on, then grabbing again. Your vision gets all lost because it's all bubbly and white water Jeez. around your face. Yeah, crazy. Do you come out like, um, full of like I don't know cuts and bruises and oh, things yeah. like that? Bumped and bruised and everything. Yeah, it's crazy. I wow. do you want to hear a terrible experience? I had yeah, once? <laughs> please go. <laughs> it was it was a shocker. It's probably it's the closest to drowning I've ever come. Was actually oh, wow. abalone diving, not wow. big wave surfing. Wow. I was, um, you know, so I've explained the situation. So you're pretty much you're moonwalking along the bottom, but it, normally it's in shallow water. So generally you can just lift your head up almost like it's in that shallow water. But I was working this one spot and there was a ledge that dropped off and at the bottom it was probably only 15 feet deep. So it wasn't really deep, but, yeah, you know, two or three times over your head. So I was up on top and I was pulling abalone and then 
I got knocked off the edge from a wave and I fell over the edge into the 15 feet yeah. kind of depth. Wow. And then as I fell down, the air got cut off um, from the <sighs> supply that comes into your hose. Wow. So you can feel it feel it tightening up a bit and you know you've got a bit of time so it's not an instant cut off you've got maybe a minute or so before it, you know yeah. you really start sucking so <laughs> and to get all your lead weights on and your vests and all that it's a lot of hassle yeah. like to get it wow. all on and so i've thought I've, i was at the bottom of the ledge knew the air supply had gone out so i thought all right i'll climb back up the top i've got a minute or so i'll just come up then you can then i can stand on the reef up top yeah up here and, you know, just breathe yeah. air, normal yeah. air. Um, I got all the way up, and it was rough at the mod, I thought, oh, and some sets my, come. My. All the way up, just got to the top, and then got thrown oh, back over no. the again. All the way back down to 15 feet. Oh, it was, yeah. It was killer. And it took me, like, almost all my breath to get to get up to the top. Oh, you my know? God. So, so I got down the bottom, and then I've had to start getting off lead vests. And you're already, and, like, you gassed already. Already gassed, mate. And it was the closest I've come to drowning. And that was kitty schoolboy era, just making bad wow. decisions. You know, so what did you do playing. then? Did you get the, the lead stuff off and then sort of yeah, just float back up? Lead vests, yeah. And then because you've got a wetsuit on, you're positively buoyant, and that just came straight to the top. So I saw stars, but fortunately didn't black out. But it was like... <laughs> So close. Touch and go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you you yeah. didn't go into like panic mode at all. You were just sort of focused on your no, breathing or were you? Yeah, back, to, back to the old, <laughs> not quite trying to go to sleep, but yeah, like, wow. you know, trying, trying to remain Happy calm while, while undressing. Yeah, for sure. Jesus. But yeah, that was a crazy, crazy little lab diving one. Wow. That's Before scary. we move on from, from like the, the water sports side of things, um, I just like to. We've spoken about towing and jet skis. Uh, I'd like to know um, a little bit more, and for our listeners as well. Like, why do you need a jet ski, and and how does that work to be towed onto a wave, and why do you sort of need that? Yeah, well, you don't always need it, and a lot of the guys are pushing the boundaries now with their paddle surfing, so just with traditional arms and just moving over. But there's some waves that just move so quickly, you just physically cannot get to them on a paddle board. So especially, we call them slabs here in Australia, especially that's like the wave I was talking about before where the, there's a big rock basically and the ocean comes in and it as, I'll give you a quick demo. Like if if the ocean floor is gradual like this, yeah. a swell will come in, and as it comes up the slope, it'll slowly stand up and slowly stand up. So that gives you enough time to paddle into it as it's standing up and cresting. Um, but with these slabs, you've got a rock in the ocean. It comes in just as a swell, not very big, and then it just goes rah, uh-huh. and just throws straight away. So you just physically don't have the time to – get to your feet or to be able to actually paddle and catch it because the swell when it's big might be moving at 40 kilometers an hour sure. and then it just hits you know and throws over so we use the jet ski we have a jet ski with a rope with a little surfer on the back to be able to generate the speed to be able to get get into the waves you know so that's that's the whole point of having a jet ski for the majority of the time is just waves that hit too hard and too fast Okay. Wow. Yeah. And so when you're talking about the slab, uh, you've surfed that big slab where you go under the underwater waterfall, which sounds <laughs> yeah. pretty much like a living hell. But anyway, yeah. uh, the, <laughs> what, what about when you're surfing, like, um, for example, you won, um, uh, which I'd like to just get on while we're still on the surfing, you, you, you won the WSL Big Wave Awards, the Tube of the Year uh, in 2017. But that was yeah. in uh, – so take us through that and also take us through – that's quite shallow water, is that right? How do you how do you end up getting like such big waves on such shallow reefs or on sand or whatever it is? That was actually at the place that I was explaining. Yeah, I, it was the WSL tube of the year. So as we're talking about big – big barrel basically and just the biggest barrel with a man standing in it um and that was at one of those waves uh, down on the south coast of australia yeah. here that just hits too hard so we were using jet ski assist on that day to pull us into it to be able to just get to the bottom of it and then yeah and then it's just hold on pretty much and tell yeah. us about the award yeah it was crazy um i've never I've never chased um, awards, probably. Uh, I've always, like I said, I've been, I'm down in Esperance um, and that's been my hometown. And we've kind of, 
my whole life, this is going to sound crazy, um, I've kind of dodged media. Um, now I'm sitting here doing a podcast with you guys, but it's uh, with with surfing and with big waves and the rest of it. Um, once it gets exposed, like once a photo is taken, like we used to surf that place which is now on the global scene probably 10 years ago and there might only be two or three guys out. The last time I went there, um, there was 15 jet skis of media, like wow. with video, wow. with you know, still photography, and because the internet's got so good, as I was saying before, with uh, swell forecasting, and then there was ten international tow teams and like and the local lads. So there was like twenty five wow. or thirty watercraft in the water. Wow! And that happens. And so I've spent my life kind of trying to stay out of that kind of scene, I guess. And because I've got a couple of wild cards up my sleeve of some good locations. Um, down on the south coast of Australia, once once you take photos of those places and they get commercialised, you can never go back. You can never take it back. And yeah. uh, and I want the adventure to live, um, kind of, yeah, for, you yeah. know, our kids or, you know, the up and coming where even if it, it's like if it's in a magazine or if it's in a video, you're not the first guy to do it. So yeah, one want, want, you know, my little daughter or little son to be able to jump on a jet ski or go touring around the coast somewhere and go think that they're maybe the first guys ever to surf somewhere, you know, and let that adventure yeah. live. So really trying to promote that as well for certain areas. Um, and it's respected, like over in Hawaii, they have, you know, everyone knows of Pipeline and the North Shore. Everyone allows photos and doesn't mind it there and the commercialisation, and it's a great thing. Um, but where people don't want it, like on some of the other islands, which is why they get a bit territorial too, yeah. is because once, once photos are taken... What went? What goes from you and your good friends, or you know, some travelling respectful visitors that just you know come and surf, you know, to oh my goodness, everyone can predict the swell at this place now. They know where it is. They've seen photos, and then there's 60 guys in the water all of a sudden, yeah. and then the dynamics, the dynamics of surfing just change altogether when you're with a few sure. people versus 60. So yeah, that's thing. So yeah, but I was. Uh, uh, like I said, at these big wave locations, there's always going to be media there. And I love photos. Like I love having memories to look back on and, you know, and when it's in the right places where people want them, I, I love it. Like I love watching a little bit of video and a bit of photo of yeah. myself and I surfing and having those moments captured. And I was lucky enough this year, um, yeah, to take out that award because of one of those photos was taken. And it was just an amazing photo of this big, Big barrel, like I say, <laughs> little, little guy standing in the middle of it. And we went over to California and a few of my other friends actually were uh, fortunate enough to be finalists in that event as well. Um, so we went over to California for the awards night. I had maybe five or six of my friends came over just for moral support as well. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. And then so we entered the event and it's it's the biggest event in big wave surfing in the world, you know. It's like it's wow. it's – so it's all these guys at school, you know, as I was a schoolboy, they're now the guys that are emceeing and, you know, and <laughs> doing the intros and the rest of it. And I walked into this venue, it was a bit of a red carpet event, all the, you know, cameras rolling and the rest of it, and walked in there and there was like this 40-foot poster of me on that wave there. Wow. No was, way. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was crazy, hey. And I walked in and I've just gone, <gasps> and, wow. you know, you don't – know what's going to happen on the night and i was like oh yes. my goodness it's like boys are going you might actually take it's this you, thing out. Like, look. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I was like whoa better uh better have a drink just to yeah, yeah, the yeah. calm the nerves a bit. <laughs> better get my speech sorted out <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was amazing amazing award and super thankful to to have won it and to wsl for holding those awards and the rest of it but yeah amazing and now it's given me a little bit more of a platform too. Not that I've, like I said, not that I've ever chased it or kind of wanted it, to be honest. Um, but I've got a with Shark Eyes, which we might delve into a little bit later. I don't yeah. know. But that's given me a little bit of a platform at least to be able to get that out there to the public and yeah. hopefully keep the, them a bit safer as well. So, yeah, it's been it's been wonderful. The whole ride has been pretty crazy and wonderful. Yeah, that, that is incredible. But I saw the photo uh, yesterday and I was like, wow, that's just – I mean, it's yeah. not something you can explain to people, I guess. Yes. You know what I mean? Just that, that feeling of 
this huge giant wave over you, but you can see out through it, and it just noise too. The noise yeah. is indescribable when you're standing. Like there's probably never. I, I love surfing big waves probably so much because there's not many moments in your life where you, unless you're really good at meditating, where you've lost all conscious thought. Yeah. Um, and in those moments, you you are just so focused on the immediate. Yeah what's happening yeah. that there's nothing so else cool. you know, in your mind so for you know as a 40 year old man yeah. nowadays so and i don't know how you guys are but you've all there's always something ticking in there you know for sure. so to have calmness and to be totally in the moment that's probably why free diving and and surfing big yeah. waves is such yeah so addictive i guess to that having that all senses overload and only being in the moment it's pretty amazing yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so uh, so just, I mean, you, you mentioned shark eyes now, and, and we're, we're totally going to go into that. But I just think like an important sort of uh, sort of way to to move into the into your new business um, is to yeah. sort of understand a little bit more about like uh, sharks. And you've had like a couple of really tragic and scary events uh, when it actually comes to sharks. And uh, one yeah. of those was uh, that was abalone fishing, I think, with your mate Greg, and yeah. he actually got attacked by a great white. And I think you've also had like um, a great white try to try to attack you as well. So, do you mind just sort of explaining a bit about that um, to us, that whole experience? Yeah, for sure. I kind of um, for ages, I probably, like I said, probably haven't like media went crazy after that first attack um, and I, you know, just took a massive step back and I, I went underground for a long time and didn't do any interviews or anything like that. Um, but I, it's, it's something I do kind of want to talk about a bit nowadays because, like I said, I've, I feel I've got a little bit of information that can probably help a few people and the rest of it as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, um, that the f first attack um, that I was involved in, well, it's it's going to happen, you know. If you spend a lot of time in the water, maybe not an attack, but you, you, we have encounters with sharks all the time, you know. So from an early age, when I was a young guy, um, we used to go beach fishing down in Esperance and we used to go fishing for sharks. We used to go catch a salmon, you know, send the salmon out as live bait okay. for a shark and catch sharks. You know? That was just a part of how we grew up, you know. Yeah. There was, and yeah. I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm, it learned a lot since back in those days and I, you yeah. know, I'll fish sustainably for food nowadays, but, um, you know, I'm not into going and catching sharks or anything like that nowadays, but, um, yeah, but my point out of that being of, uh, interactions that we've had have started since, you know, maybe since I was 12, you know, dealing with sharks and fishing and spear fishing. And it's not uncommon when you're spear fishing even, a practice we used to use which i don't anymore either is we used to burly up you used to shoot a fish you know then you'd burly up that little fish mm. big fish would come and then the really big fish would come you know so <laughs> you fish and then you dodge the sharks you know and as they would get more riled up um up northwest wa we used to go up trying to shoot spanish mackerel and other species of pelagics up there and they're just they're there, you know. They're, you're always seeing hammerheads, tigers, bronzies, bull sharks, all those things in the warmer waters, and it's just something you become accustomed to dealing with when you're in the water all the time. Um, yeah, so when you're abalone diving down on the south coast, you're in the cold border, um, and the main species that you're worried about uh, is the great white shark. So they're basically, you know, they're the big daddy down there. So you're going to have interactions with them. If you spend a lot of time in the water, it's just going to happen. And the ab divers, you know, they're the guys spending the most time in the water. So I was down in Esperance. Um, we were 400 k's east of Esperance. I think I can remember I told you the, that's a town of 15,000. Yeah. And the nearest town from that is Albany, which is a town of 30,000 or so. But it's – and we were four hours east of Esperance. So we're, we're wow. a long way out in the middle of nowhere. Wow. So just take the picture of it. You've, you've got to drive a four-wheel drive down a track. You launch with a tractor 
and then you drive up to your camp, which is further up, and then you set up a camp and a caravan, oh. you know, up. So we're in the middle of nowhere, yeah. launching off a beach. It's not a boat ramp scenario, you know, and a town nearby or anything like that. And normally there's six, the area is zoned, Western Australia is cut into zones, and there's only six teams that run probably a 400-kilometre stretch or 500-kilometre stretch, and we hadn't seen anyone. We were out diving out that area for about a month or six weeks and just hadn't seen anyone. And then on this one day, it was 2013 or 2014, which I should know, but uh, sorry. But um, anyway, we're out this day, and then uh, Greg Pickering and young Callum, who was Decky, uh, ended up turning up this day. And like I said, middle of nowhere, and you haven't seen anyone in four to six weeks. And then luckily we were there. Um, and then throughout the day anyway, we got half a day diving, and I was underwater and we were working, and this never happens either. We were working a stone's throw away from each other. Yeah. So there was Greg Pickering and Callum on one boat and myself and Andrew Rowe on another boat, um, a stone's throw from each other. And we were, I was underwater uh, at the time, um, and then Greg Pickering got hit by White. Like you said, he was uh, head first. Um, he was down on the bottom, working away, chipping off abs, and the sharks come front on and grabbed his torso up to his chest. And so he was head – he's probably the only guy. What he's Jesus. alive too. Don't, he's alive, so this is a success story. But he's probably <laughs> the only guy that's ever been halfway in a great white shark and then has managed to survive. Wow. So anyway, um, his – yeah, he's managed to somehow get back to the surface and – the guy that was on boat, his decky, um, Callum, was just went into a bit of a state of shock. And luckily we were just just across, like I was saying, a, a few hundred metres away. And we managed to, yeah, we managed to get up. And then I, I got pulled up um, out of the water. So I hit the deck. And then we, from there we administered first aid and managed to keep him alive. But it was probably like a five-hour ordeal i guess you would say to get him from in the water back to camp which was like a 20 minute drive by boat and then get him out of the water you know there's the logistics of getting out of the actual boat out of the water and bits and pieces and then we managed to keep him alive um and that that was for about four hours until we managed to get into an ambulance which took him back into town so it was it was crazy and um was he conscious during that time in and out of consciousness, um, but yeah, very, very vague. Like, and as you can imagine, like he, the only reason he wasn't in two pieces is, like I mentioned before, the ab divers they wear a lead vest, yeah, mm-hmm. and we have a bottle, like a spare reserve bottle, on the back um, that we carry just in case the air does get tapped wow. off. You can tap the bottle, so that the shark, as it was hitting him, as it was chomping, was hitting. No way. Chest and bits and pieces, but the bottles and the lead vest as well. But on the way out, um, yeah, he got really messed up. Um, like Tarantino could have mm. done a better job of making someone look terrible. You know, it was Jesus. it was crazy. It was um, yeah, we were yeah tr- trying to. Um, we have oxygen on board uh, on the board there, and you know, a regulator that you put in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to, to it was hard to try to find somewhere to to wow. actually get oxygen into him because he he was just messed. Yeah, he was messed up. It was crazy. So, um, yeah. You know, on, yeah. on the way out the shark because thing. So it was the fact that he's alive is such a you know success success story. I guess yeah. So that's it was crazy day, yeah. crazy day. Wow, we but so so like. So the sharks literally got him, right? It's like, you know, covering him from his head to his torso. And then did, mm. did he, does he talk about it all, what he did, like how he kind of got out of there? Did he, what is he doing? Did, like, I mean, he's inside. How does he actually? Mm. No, he just doesn't have a memory. You know, I don't know if you got, I've had a few accidents and bits and pieces and, yeah. you know. like Mind even, blocks yeah, it out. Mind blocks it out. So he can remember being hit. And then he doesn't remember. He remembers hitting the surface, 
and then that's pretty much all he remembers. He's got mm-hmm. vague recollection of being in the boat on the way back. But, yeah, it was crazy. Jeez. I spent just a – yeah, I spent probably two hours. You know, there's a four-wheel drive track um, oh just God. pushing my legs against his – uh, against his back holding because he had wounds, you know, everywhere yeah. trying to compress different wounds. Wow. And the craziest thing was he, he had all the meanwhile, he had this tooth. <laughs> no, this is going to sound like a story, but it's crazy. He had this tooth lodged on in the inside of his eye socket that was hanging out the inside of his eye socket. No, it was no crazy. God. It was crazy, mate. And oh, yeah, God. and he's alive. He's alive. It's It's crazy. Yeah, wow, me. so yes, um, strong yeah. man, Greg. Good on you, mate. Yeah. If you see this, it's um, you're a you're a man mountain, mate. Yeah, but Jeez. I mean, you know, it's it, for you as well. That must have been quite a harrowing experience, you know, like just having to help administer, I guess, either CPR or or just even supporting him, you know, like and and talking him through it. Like, you, what are you saying to him at the time? You're like, bud, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Don't worry. You, positive affirmation i guess you know was kind of my role um yeah just trying to yeah this is funny because i haven't probably haven't actually gone into depth you know with this one apart from you guys yeah but i guess i was just positive affirmation the yeah. the whole time trying to keep oxygen in him and then <laughs> going look yeah you're gonna be okay when yeah. i didn't think he was gonna be okay you know so yeah, we we didn't. I didn't think there was a chance at all that he was going to survive. We, you know, in and out of consciousness. Was, wow. I thought he'd lost way too much blood, just from what was going on. And yeah, so yeah, Jesus. we just kept on assuring him that it was going to be okay and trying to maintain oxygen. And then yeah, and then managed to pass him on to to the real medical staff. So yeah, crazy. And so gaff, how long gaff, he must have had a massive recovery then? Like, what was his? Like, did yeah, he just stay I'm, there in hospital for some time or did they transfer him to, like, a bigger hospital? Or? Yeah, he got transferred. Um, Royal Flying Doctor took him straight up to the major hospital up in Perth. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then I'm not sure. I think he was about a month in hospital. But crazily enough, most of his injuries were kind of superficial, which is why he wow. didn't bleed out. If he yeah. had, a, you know, there was about 10 places on him. Jeez. But if it had been this much further Jesus. one way or the other, you know, he had... Even his neck, he had a massive big yes. hole in his neck, but it didn't hit his jugular. Wow. So it's crazy. He's so, just... so there you guys are, and this helicopter's flying off. And... No, no, so... this is the thing. Like, we jumped on the sat phone. I was in the boat, and immediately we have sat phones on the boat, and we've rang up and we've gone, look, um, I've jumped on the other boat quickly just to assess Greg, and I've jumped on the boat and gone, Oh my goodness, you know, because when you first see, think someone's been hit by a shark, you, you're hoping it's a bronze whaler, you know. Um, they're quite a quite a lot smaller animal, and you can, you know, definitely sustain injuries, but it's probably not life threatening all the time. Um, so jumped on and then jumped back onto our boat, and it was like my friend Andrew, uh, my colleague who I was on boat with, um, he's gone. How is it? And it's like. It's a white titty, mate. He's he's probably not going to make it, you know. Wow. And that was instant. I've jumped on the sat phone and instantly called for a chopper. Um, and then, you know, we were engaged with the people that were trying to, and it was like became obvious after about 15 minutes um, on the way back in, this is on the boat ride back in to shore, that we weren't going to get a chopper. So it was like, wow. all right, we've, we've got to, you know, we've got to, do this ourselves, guys. So then it was oh, really, man. yeah. Then it was like, all right, we're gonna lock into this and yeah. really start sorting ourselves out. That must have been super scary because you're like, it, we, yeah, that's it's us. It's we're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's game day. You know, it's like, Jesus. all right, well, this is this is game day. So mm. no, but he's he survived, so it was great. It's yeah. like yeah. I said, I try to definitely put a positive spin on it. Um, yeah, the lasting effects of that for me lasted for a while. As well, like I quit ab diving after that and changed my career. Um, I was just and didn't didn't surf or couldn't go in the water for almost a year. It was it was crazy. Like I tried to re-enter the water um, probably about it was maybe two weeks later. Um, I thought, all right, I'm going to go and force the issue here. Yeah, you know, 
I don't know if you know Esperance, but it's beautiful, like white sands, clear beaches. It was like you could see as far as, you know, you could see a kilometre out. It was The water was that crystal clear. So I had definitely no problems that there wasn't any sharks there. But I got up to my knees with my surfboard under my arm. I broke into tears, started dry reaching, and then wow. just went back up. And I was like, all right, right I can't, can't do it. And I'd, I've always kind of... Uh, probably viewed myself as quite a strong male, I guess, you know. Mm. I guess a lot of South African males probably the <laughs> same. <laughs> but, uh, you know, kind of go, all right, I, I can handle myself and I've Stiff got a bit up of a lip and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just bite my, bite my lip here and get into it. Tried again the next day and I just forced the issue. So I did, I paddled out, um, got out the back, sat there for like about an Instantly, up to knee-deep water again, started crying and dry reaching. Wow, yeah. And then forced through it for about an hour and just made myself stay out there. Wow. And it was just like, this is no good. So I paddled back in and I just said, all right, if I never go in the water again, I don't mind. I'm just I'm going to let it happen naturally. I'm definitely not going to force it. And I kind of hung up the boots, hung up the surfing wow. boots. I had to change career. And, yeah, so it was, it was a crazy crazy time and I was probably looking back at it I'm probably still a little bit to be honest probably a little bit of PTSD in there yeah, with, with what happened and the rest of it yeah wow and do you do you feel, anyway, do you feel the, now like a bit scared when you go into the water yeah definitely like I've definitely um back to you know how we were, I was talking about training the younger guys up and the school kids I think I've definitely learned some amazing things through all this and through some other life experiences like when we talk about my brother and other bits and pieces just how how to deal with a bit of post-traumatic stress and actually you know look to positive vices you know where i i hit the bottle ridiculously hard after oh, that wow. you know like just yeah drank too much just trying mm. to numb numb everything and the rest of it as well sure so, yeah, just learning, really learning how to deal with things and better. And yeah, and then so eventually now I'm in the water. I'm definitely conscious of it, but I, I'm a lot wiser in the water too. And my decisions of like we weren't even using shark cages, you know, lab diving, which is crazy. Okay. And Greg wasn't using a shark cage either, you know, he was free swimming in open water which, you know, the majority of teams down in Esperance, they use shark cages for okay. for that reason. They wow. don't want to, you know, you're driving around in an hydraulically powered cage, chipping abs uh -huh. from the protection of your cage. Um, oh, wow. But being young and, you know, you want to have those encounters though too. Like it's like a lion, I guess, in Africa where yeah, just... who, gets, who gets to see the king of the bird, you know, king yeah. of the jungle in its natural environment. Yeah. So I used to enjoy having encounters with whites and with, you know, top predatory sharks. Um, yeah, but that's definitely changed. I just I have healthy respect now and it's like I, yeah. I don't mind if I never see one again, to be yeah, totally yeah. honest, because uh, sure. I probably, yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. So I'm definitely scared, sure, but I don't let mm. it hinder me nowadays and I'm still active in the water, spearfishing, surfing and diving and yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah, that's uh, wow, bad. Yeah, geez, that's that's a really intense story, and thanks for sharing it with us. Um, yeah, and, uh, no worries. And it's you know, like that's a great way to kind of go into um, you know what you're doing now. Like you, you know, obviously sharks have played a big role in your life, and you know, as well as uh, yeah. you know, you're teaching. You know, you're teaching people how to do things safely, and you know, you. I'm sure like environmentalism is a big part of your life too. But you've you've built up this company now called uh, shark eyes um mm. and you know it's uh, it's basically i guess to prevent uh, shark attacks mostly for people that are surfing but i'm sure you know you can put it on any sort of vessel do you, can you just sort of talk us about a bit about how this sort of came about and then tell us about the company and and what's been going on and and how it's going and where, where you are going with it yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, you definitely know as much as anyone about me now, guys. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's my background. I've spent a lot of time in the water. And one thing that we use at work um, and it, and something that we knew about, it was like after that point, it was like, all right, well, 
we're sitting on something here that we've got to get out to the general public a little bit and keep them a bit safer. Um, and and then henceforth, uh, Shark Eyes um, got the company formed. Um, and we started, We I've written up an education manual on safe diving practices, on, you know, safe surfing practices, how to handle yourself when you have an encounter. Because like um, every, probably not too many people have regular dealings, but there's nothing like this exists when it comes to having interactions with sharks. So I guess over in Africa, you might have a tour guide that says, you know, stay in the vehicle, you know, don't do this or don't do that, don't. Yeah. Don't feed the lion, you know, something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go pee in the bush in the corner on your own. <laughs> so with those kind of things, it's kind of, um, it just hasn't been done with sharks and shark safety. So I devoted myself um, and a lot of personal funds and everything to getting a manual kind of illustrated and written up and the rest of it. And then we weren't quite ready to commercialise all that kind of stuff and we haven't actually released that yet, um, which is a shame because I'm, I'm still trying to get that out there. Um, but then I uh, did a bit of surfing, uh, like we mentioned, that got a bit of attention. So we had to launch. And one of the things that comes with all the shark information pack and shark safety is a shark deterrent in the simple form of a sticker. Um so that's what we had ready to release. So we released Shark Eyes in the form of the decal itself, the sticker itself to be able to, yeah, get it out there and use the media that I had from the surfing to be able to generate interest in Shark Eyes and, and that. So that's how it all kind of started and that was May last year. Oh, that's cool. And and how, how that, does it actually work? Like can you just explain a bit about it? And And is it something you've been able to patent? Yeah, we've got patents and trademarks running, which is is kind of good. Um, but it's kind of it's one of those one of those ones that I kind of want everyone to be doing it. So I feel like a bit of a mug that there's you know that we <laughs> have applied for patents and bits and pieces. But um, yeah, we're getting it out there as much as we can as well. But um, yeah, so um, what well, I miss yeah, the yeah, no no the just bit. like what how do people use it basically like yeah. Yeah, sorry, I haven't even explained what Shark Eyes is. Yeah. Um, I haven't even got one on me. I should. Can I run away for yeah, two minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, man. please. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll yeah. Just go grab one. Of course, man. <laughs> but but is it is it my computer or is his a little bit like? Uh, does it stop and start a bit? No, no, it's his, bud. Oh yeah, Kiff, okay. I was like, oh, jeez. Okay. Yours has been smooth. How's mine been? All right. Yeah, yours is smooth as well. Yeah. Yeah, yours yeah. too, bud. Yeah. Okay, Kiff. I was like, no, <laughs> but it's a great chat, eh? Yeah, but it's been yes. awesome, man. Yes. yes. Yo, got a copy. Hey, good stuff. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> hey, good. sorry guys. Yeah, oh, I thought no, no. I had a thing. Oh, there we go. Ah, uh, cool. Just go back a bit. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, wow. oh, awesome. Okay, yeah. Cool, cool. Are they so, for people big, listening, uh, How the, this simple. is we're looking at the little um, sort of mm. uh, piece of vinyl with two. Uh, very uh, clear eyes looking at you that are, look very, very human, uh, in my opinion. But uh, so, just for the that people was, listening, that was how they were based. And as crazy simple as this seems, um, it's probably the most thing that we have to be able to change a shark's decision on in its risk assessment of whether it attacks or not. Um, there's electronic. Uh, electronic devices and other bits and pieces which do have merit um, and they do work to a certain extent but nothing at all on the market is fail safe um, and we definitely want to uh, say that with our product as well too it's like we don't want anybody putting themselves in situations that they wouldn't because of the fact that they are using a shark deterrent but um yeah something so simple that can be so effective. And I don't know if you guys have seen, I'm going to pull up another little thing. I don't yeah. know if you see it. Uh, okay, cool, yeah. yeah. See that? Yeah, oh, yeah. A, oh, so, so little eyes, eyes actually. On variety of animals yeah. have, you seen? that have um, like eyes on them as like camouflage or as a deterrent or mimicry. or. Bas basically, it's mimicry. It's nature's defense. Um, and what it, what it does is some animals use mimicry to pretend that they're other animals. Um, and another element of it is to take away the element of surprise um, from an apex predator. 
So if you can imagine, sharks have a risk assessment. So they'll be swimming around and actually looking at something on top. They've got amazing electro sensors as well, and they definitely use those. Um, that's not to understate how critical all the other elements of their thing, but they're visual creatures as well. And so they go in, they'll find whatever it is, they'll visually inspect and they'll go, okay, well, what is that up on the surface? Is it a log or is it food or what the heck is it? Yeah. And this is at the very start of their predation, of their risk assessment. And in that risk assessment, if they see it kicking and it's not doing anything, they go, okay, well, this thing's just moving. It looks like a target. It then proceeds to, okay, this might actually be worthwhile attacking and then proceed into attack mode or proceed to inspect more and then attack. But something so simple as having eyesight or line of sight trickery from up on top of the water, the shark swims in, looks up at the surface and goes, what is that? And they go, oh, bugger, this thing's seen me already. Oh, so wow. therefore it's, it's taken away the elements of surprise. And so it goes, okay, what is that? And you mentioned before it's like this thing looks like human eyes. We don't want the eyes to look like anything naturally that they see in their uh, predation. Yeah. So we don't want it to look oh. like a seal. We don't want it to look like another shark. We don't want it to look like a fish. We want it to look like something unnatural yeah. that's not normally in the water. So then it has that risk assessment and it goes, what is that thing? It's like, bugger, it's big. It's got big eyes. <laughs> yeah. and. I've, I no longer have the element of surprise. I yeah. no longer have the edge. So at the risk of self-harm or at the risk of this thing being able to avoid it, it can instinctively change the animal to go, okay, I'm, I'm moving on to see the next thing and find the next thing that fits into that risk wow. assessment. Wow. Does yeah. that make sense or not? Yeah, it makes, it makes perfect sense. sense. It's amazing. So it's like, this is, wow. You go something so simple, you know, and the bit that I uh, like, and don't get me wrong, we're not saying that, this is a shark cage. It's not a shark cage. Yeah. So we please, yeah. please don't think that I'm trying to say that. But for the price of a couple of beers or a cup of coffee, you can use what I think is the best defense that we have to be able to do this, you know. It's, so this is why I just really, I get, you know, you, hopefully you guys can see that there's a yeah. bit of heart in this one. Yeah, um, for sure. Want to keep crew safer and not, it almost feels, seems like a bit of a fairy tale sometimes or a bit of a story because with sticker in hand, I'm going, how can this, you know, with my experience and the rest of it, and I think that's the only thing that does give people a bit of confidence is to go, okay, well, yeah. wait a minute, this thing. But then I knew anecdotally, and everyone knows anecdotally how effective line of sight trickery is, like um, the absolute that we have consists of world champion spear fishermen, marine scientists from National Geographic, you know, um, all the abalone guys, yeah. like all the guys that are having... Joe Knight you mentioned already. Yeah, Joe Knight from One Ocean International. He's on there as well. Um, it's all people that have first-hand interactions with sharks, putting their face and name to help us out, get this out there. Um, with no, We're not dropping them big bundles of money to you know put their face yeah. name this or anything but all because they know how effective line of sight trickery is um can i give one quick example yeah, um, to you guys? yeah for sure Humans? super interested but this is yeah this is really um it sends it home like i said not everyone can understand uh sharks necessarily because not many people have spent as much time in the water as the spear fishermen and the ab guys like myself but um i'm going to bring up my little cheat sheet here again yeah yeah you see, can you see? That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? <laughs> is, is that the one? Face mask? With, the India one. Yeah, it's yeah. from India. Yeah, yeah. So it's got face mask back of heads. Yeah. I don't know if you can see all the fishermen on the boat there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically, yeah. there's this little village up in India, and they were having attacks by tigers at the death rate of 60 a year. So getting hit, losing 60 people a year wow. Um, wow. from tiger attacks. They introduced the face masks to the back of heads. Wow. Nobody nobody with a mask got hit after that. Wow. And that's that's how powerful line of sight trickery is, you know? And that's purely because if you can imagine everyone can imagine the cat, you know, yeah. if you it's walking so it's like bugger this thing see me, you know, yeah, once yeah. again. It's, it just doesn't quite fit into the risk assessment of ambush predators. It's really so instinct, instinctively it can change the animal's behavior, you know. 
But you know, you know what's just, really um, interesting is I, I've even like, seen research which is kind of, I mean, I guess it's in all animals. That's the thing is like if you if they put like a picture of eyes on like somewhere in the in an office or something like that, um, the like the amount of stealing and the amount of crazy. like crazy stuff that happens is is like goes down like drastically, and it's yeah. for the same reason it's all like just innate uh, within all animals that that eyes are like you know they're watching you. <laughs> A good example like I use to the young kids to try to explain it because sometimes you get into mimicry and the science behind it and all, yeah. all of these bits and pieces. Um, it's, it's like very simple. It's like if you've got two guys, you know, <laughs> one's facing you and one's not, which one's easier to catch, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's the guy that's not looking at you. You can go grab him. <laughs> yeah, the guy yeah. that's looking at you, he can run away, he can dodge you, he can hit you back. It's so true. It's just instinctively if you've got to catch something – you don't want it looking at you. And that's yeah. the, the simple, you know, theory of shark eyes. But the anecdotal evidence that's there is ridiculous, you know. Yeah. You. It's not, or it doesn't have to be proven, you know. Nature has adapted to this as a means of defense. So, and we've all seen it firsthand, how a shark actually changes its behavior. As soon as you're in the water, the first thing you need to do if you have an encounter is you face it and you make your presence known. And instantly, it'll go around and it'll try to skulk around to your back or it'll move out a little bit further so it's just out of your vision. Wow. There was a study done, the leading scientist on Great Whites, he's over in Northern California, um, Cum Cumberhand or something or other, forgive my yeah. scientific... I, I didn't <laughs> we'll we'll up find his name for you. Should. Yeah, go and, yeah, we'll have to go and hunt him down. He actually put a mannequin in the water with Whites and he got a mannequin and the whites would approach from always swim around and approach from back. And as soon as he turned it, they'd veer off and they'd go around the other way, you know. They wow. always will approach from a blind side. They don't want to be wow. – yeah. they don't want to come and have an encounter head on a lot of the time, you know. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, and after saying that, sometimes if you get a rogue shark or you yeah. get an angry shark that's just had some food or something – yeah, you just nothing, can't tell, but nothing, it's their wild it's animals, wild, it's you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And then the beauty of shark eyes is um, at the initial risk assessment, that can take place from up to 10 to 15 metres away. So before you've even, if you've got, if a shark has decided that it's going to hit you, nothing's going to stop it. Whereas this here, something so simple. Crazy, man. A set of eyes on your thing can actually get into its headspace before it makes that decision, oh, you know, cool. and go, okay, from 10 to 15 metres away when this thing has first seen me or even in dirty water, they've got really good vision. And so from as close as it is that they see you, it goes, okay, instantly this no longer fits the criteria of actually getting into that mode and, ang and getting angry. So but, there but it is, guys. I think it's, it's so clever though, bad. Like, I mean, like you said, it's so simple but it's so clever because what you've actually done is you've gone, right, let's put ourselves into the situation of a wild animal and think about how they might react and how they might be in their environment. And, and you, <laughs> you've, you've literally like, um, sort of just thought of it's that, nature, which is, which is amazing. You know what I mean? And, and I'm just trying to think just... like of like the human sort of, uh, version of it. It's like, say, say you're like looking at a, you know, another, like if you're a guy you're looking at a girl or you girl, you're looking <clears> at a guy and then, they're not, you know, like you're actually checking them out. And then as soon as they look at you, you're like, whoa. And you kind of, you know, you look away because you're like, damn, I've been busted. It's like, it's almost the same sort of thing, if you know what I mean. It's like, exactly it's, the same, hey. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. really is. It's so simple. But it's like, you, yeah, it's instinct. It's instinctively in all of us, like you said, back to, you know, back to the shoplifting yeah. kind of the camera. If you know you're being watched, your behavior changes. Wow. You, so you don't have what, what about like so you can put this on your dive tank you can put this on your surfboard and but, but like is it i was just thinking now <laughs> if i was going to go surfing and i was thinking okay shit i'm a little nervous about this uh do you put like 25 pairs of eyes on you or <laughs> like <laughs> no we work? probably we probably don't want to indicate that we're lots of lots of animals um we want to indicate the bigger the eye indicates the larger the animal so we want it to think that we are one large animal, you know. So that's, yeah, just one one set. 
And as simple as it seems, like we did heaps of work. Like they don't know if it's going to be a little bit, maybe a little bit hard to see through thing, but sharks see contrast and depth of field. They don't know if they've seen, they see color or not. The jury's still out with the science behind that one. Um, so we've tried to create these eyes. So they have like a Mona Lisa effect. So, you know, they're there and no matter which way you look, they're oh, yeah. still, still Looking kind of engage, you. engaging you. Yeah. We don't use reflectives or we don't use 3Ds because we don't want to drag attention to ourselves and yeah. have it, you know, sparkle like a fish or whatever the case is. Yeah. Yeah. But if we've been seen, we want the animal to know that you've been seen back. Yeah, wow. well, the product range that we have, we're doing dive fins at the moment, um, but mainly for the commercial guys. They're quite, quite a top-end set of gear. Um, they're carbon Kevlar kind of composite so for the abalone divers and the serious free free divers and those guys um but we're just about and like i said all this has been self-funded so it's it is a startup and i'm pushing so i can only roll out the products yeah as as i kind of can as the company grows but <clears throat> the biggest one at the moment which is so simple too and this is the cost effectiveness of just the actual decal or the sticker itself and surfers are the main guys that are vulnerable. So that's really the base that we wanted to have cover yeah. first, you know. It's um, over in Australia here too. There's, like I said, I've learnt a lot as I've grown up and I've probably, have, you know, I've done a few things I regret with the environment and other bits and pieces when I was younger for sure. But over in Australia at the moment, there's a bit of, debate you know shark vets nets sorry versus culling versus a lot of other methods tagging and bits and pieces um and to be able to have a non-invasive method and yeah. go look guys we we haven't even utilized everything that we've got at, that we know as humans and it's and it's like let's get this information out there and what i honestly to believe to be the most effective shark deterrent just happens to be the simplest yeah. one that nature uses as a yeah, defense sure. and that's accessible to everyone so we can't police the whole ocean it's just it's too yeah, big and we probably and we probably shouldn't be you know yeah. so to be able to look after our own space in the water let's at least utilize everything we have first as humans and as you know utilize yeah. all that knowledge to protect ourselves before we go delving into you know invasive methods of trying 100%. to protect ourselves so yeah I'm, I'm really excited and passionate about this one um to be able to be trying to help out and it's been great we've been received amazingly in australia um in particular because that's where our focal point has been um, we've just launched in the united states uh, probably two months ago Cool. And that's been going amazingly well. Um, the Fisheries WA, which is great, are using our product um, here in WA. Um, I'm just having a meeting, hopefully been in touch with the Minister for Fisheries this week, been in touch with Surf Life Saving WA and awesome. got meetings with those guys. Yeah, and Surfing WA. So it's just starting to get traction now and you know, and get out there a little bit. But as you can un understand, like it's, there's so many people that have given shark deterrence a bad name right now yeah, because yeah. there is some stuff on the market that is just, it's a gimmick that is trying to make some money. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I've, <laughs> I need to try to make some money out of this. Yeah, sure. To get it out there more and like I was saying, to get the education package out that we have and the rest of it and simply support my family. Of course. So hopefully that will turn into this um, along with other bits and pieces. Um, but, yeah, to be able to get the knowledge out there of why this is effective um, comes through the medium that I'm doing here with you guys yeah, now. Sure. You know? yeah, yeah. And that's, that's really valuable that's because, yeah. And so, like, as you guys saw, like, when you first see a decal or a sticker in hand, you kind of go, What's what's this going to do, you know? But then yeah. instantly after a minute or two of talking about it, you go, just wait a minute. Totally. This kind of makes, makes sense, sense, you know? Yeah. Perfect sense. Mm. And then with the confidence that comes from, you know, it's pretty much the who's who's of Australian watermen going, look, this has merit. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, sure. Then it's 
okay, let's let's do this, guys. Let's get okay. it out there and keep some crew safer. Yeah, totally. Sure. And and do you have any plans to launch it, say, like in South Africa or you know other countries now? I mean, I know you've done the US, but anywhere else as well. Yeah, definitely. It's we've got interest. We've got some guys from over South Africa that are looking to, uh, I think, distribute at the moment. But my hands have just been so busy and tied up with the states and Australia at the moment, and keeping things rolling there. Yeah, sure. That I just have. I've only just come back off. Um, a promotional run over in the States and cool. touring big way project to try to get it out there. I toured with Timber Knife and um, from Swell Chasers for about two months, um, guest speaking there and trying to promote Shark Eyes through that medium as well. So I've only just got back into WA yeah. down to little old Margaret River and starting to really <laughs> ramp up all these other things now and use the contacts that I have to be able to, uh, yeah. yeah, to be able to do that. Hey, do you guys want to meet my wife quickly? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> Fellow Sapper. Come say howdy ho. <laughs> yeah. she, didn't, she doesn't have a choice now. From hey, PE, yeah, we yeah, hear. Yeah. Don't, she can't hear us, though. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey there, how's it going? We just, uh, we just put our little daughter to bed just then. Oh, so. that's cool, man. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no baby food. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is cool. Nice to meet you. <laughs> what? Oh yeah. Oh, there we go. Hey, how's it going? How are you? So which one's the fellow PE? That's me. That's Craig <laughs> there. <laughs> I recognised you. Oh, there we go. Uh, well, walk, PE is not big enough to to not know someone that we each know, you know, in common. So, <laughs> so if, if we had five minutes, we'd uh, we'd find a few common 100%, friends. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Shannon, he can't help it. He's just surrounded by sappers now, left, right, and centre. You're in trouble now, my man. How did you not know that she was from South Africa? Like, how is that possible? Oh, I, I did, but I didn't put two and two together that my daughter was going to be hard. Uh -huh. So that was the, the shot. No, he, he, he just said the other day, he went, oh, my gosh, Olive's, Olive's half Safa. Uh -huh. <laughs> what are you on about? And he was like, I, I just didn't think about it like that. I've got a Safa kid. Not the sharp school mission. All the big waves. Oh, <laughs> Taking a few months. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. <laughs> well, nice to yeah. meet you. Cool. So well, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to nice to yeah, put a face to the name and yeah, yeah totally. Right. We didn't meet Olive though. <laughs> Olive, yeah. yeah. Just gone to bed. She's a little cutie. Uh -huh. She is that. Yeah. Oh, that's Takes after mama. <laughs> <laughs> no brain. Oh, classic. <laughs> Cool. Well, this is this is a uh, thanks so much for for saying hi. It was cool that to put a face to the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good to meet you guys. Cool, you and, too. Uh, cool. I better get back to cooking fish. Now, ah. now get in the kitchen and make me some tea. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you, whatever. You know that's not the truth. <laughs> no, you can't speak to a South African woman like that. Bro. Yeah, but you'll, I am, you'll... I want to this time, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm lucky I've got a couple talk. of hours off to come see you guys. Yeah, yeah that's cool. <laughs> cool well, stuff. Um, this is a good time. Cool, yeah, you too. Thanks. See you later. See, see you good later. Bye. Bye. Cheers, bye. This is obviously a good time, Shannon, to <laughs> just, um, you know, wrap things up. Uh, obviously, you're conscious yeah. of the time. Thank you for for spending the time explaining your story. I think it means a lot to us and to our listeners to understand how you get to where you are and why you're building the business that you are building. And it makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I think there's so much value in that. And, and we're really grateful for, for that, for that background. I think it, that, that it makes the world of a dis difference to your, to your product as well, you know? So, so thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks and, heaps uh, for getting it out there with us as well. It's kind of a, uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, like I said, there's a bit of heart behind this one and, you know, we really feel we can be doing some good. And, um, and along with that comes, you know, comes the storytelling otherwise it wouldn't it wouldn't have the same punch i don't think so right. i've become aware of that just in the last little while that i've got to start loving this a little bit more yeah. and getting amongst yeah. it so yeah so thanks very much for having us on board and yeah and cool. letting us talk about things and and get it out there and yeah. great great to finally meet you guys yeah you yeah. too bud and now uh, what what's the mm -hmm. best way for people to kind of get a hold of you like on social media or your website 
Yeah, social media or website for sure. So you can have a look at um, and have a look at the science too. Um, some of the papers and the science that we quote off Shark Eyes, it's really interesting to see, you know, the line of yeah. how line of sight works and, you know, how good their vision is. So go to our website and have a look at that at www.sharkeyes.com.au. Um, and if you type in Shark Eyes, you should find us quite easily. Um, yeah, and if anybody out there does want to make contact in any way, shape or form regards ocean training or even if they've had some, you know, traumatic experience or whatever the case is that uh, they think I might be able to help out with, don't get me wrong, I'm not a psychologist by any means, but sometimes when you can just have a listening ear and somebody who's, you know, shared some similar experiences it's nice sometimes just to bounce bounce off people yeah. feel free to get in contact with us um probably do that through instagram or facebook would be the best best way and um if you look for shannon worrell you'll be able to find me i'm sure so yeah cool yeah well but we put a lot i mean we put a lot of show notes together for each episode and that has all your contact details in so we'll share that with everybody uh, for yeah, sure. that'd be great. And, yeah, and, and ju- just be- just before, like, um, I say cheers. Like, I-, I don't know if you've have you heard of an Australian guy called Paul de Gelder? Um, no, I haven't. He basically he was uh, like a marine a diver, and he yeah. was probably the second guy ever to get uh, bitten and attacked oh, by a shark was in, this in Sydney. Sydney Harbour. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, by a bull shark. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I've been. This is one of those things I've had since this has started. I've had some amazing people think that my records are absolutely terrible because quite often I've been traveling and I've written down a note and I haven't yeah. been. But yeah. have you got contact for this guy? Is no, that I was, I was, or? I was just going to find out if you knew him because I, I was, I've listened to a podcast with him and I'll send it to you. It's, it's a guy called uh, yep, Rich Roll. Yep. He's on his podcast and um, yep, it is probably one of the like most amazing like stories you'll listen to you know what i mean and uh and also then his story now and his relationship with sharks and fishing yeah. and everything else and i think uh he would be a great guy to kind of at least sort of um swap stories with and and talk about what yeah. you're doing because um you yep. know and being a fellow aussie you know sort of you have that extra connection so yeah. i'll send you the details of that for sure yeah, that'd be amazing. Thank yeah. you. Cheers for that. Yeah, cool. No worries. And then just just from me, like I just want to say, Flip Man, thanks so much for uh, <laughs> for telling your story. I promise you, like you know, and, and I, yeah. I literally reckon if we were in person, I would be chatting to you for like another three hours for sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's so much stuff that we we didn't even get to. You know that I'm sure. I was gonna say if yeah. you are, <laughs> yeah, you would laugh. Like, I know we've had a really long chat, but there's there's a lot. There's a lot more that you would like. You would, yeah. yeah. I feel like my life has been a movie, to be totally honest. There's, yeah. a, lot of, there's a lot of Just other bits the and pieces that, yeah, that we haven't gone into, but I, I hope that what we have, have talked about, you know, will help end up helping someone yeah, in some way. Sure. Yeah, For sure. Like, totally. Shape or form, but yeah. Totally. So, I mean, I'm sure like, like even, you know, it seems like especially lately with a, a few of our other guests, it's almost like a part two is needed, like, you know, six months in the future just to catch up on catch the up. parts that we missed and then also yeah. like, see how things are going for you. But, but yeah, but your story was seriously amazing. Um, I find it just fascinating, like with what you've done, you know what I mean? And like uh, living a life in the water and what you've learned by doing that is just like incredible. You know what I mean? Like you, it, there's no, there's absolutely no issue that like flip, you finished your school at your 10, whatever, because you've learned so much more by sort of being in the game, being in there, dealing with, um, you know, the environment firsthand. And you speak so like knowledgeably and, uh, passionately about it, which, is will just like rub off on people too and you know it's rubbed off yeah, on me hopefully. for sure and what you're doing is so great in terms of the education and but then you know taking it that next level to actually look out for people and you know developing ways of sort of uh, deterring sharks is just just awesome so but just thanks so much for the chat thanks for being so honest about it and and going deep into some stories that i know like are super hard to tell again as well so that was really really cool and we just wish you all the best you know we're rooting for you 
and uh, we'll we'll spread uh, the word of shark eyes as much as we can as well. And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks heaps, guys. Cool, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> nice to finally meet you guys and have a yeah, big chin wag. Yeah, 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 really yeah. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, uh, that was great, It was really, you, really man. cool, man. Thank you. Really, really valuable. Really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>